I've just immediately started recording. I'm like, yeah, let's, yep. <laughs> yep. Let's get to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the mostest, Christy Hawksborough. How you feeling? Um, in a word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there's a lot going sure. on. A lot. Um, and I just don't even, I don't even have words. Like there's... Today was, I have really down to the wire before. I've been very close, but this time, yeah. like literally you sent the Zoom link and I was still like a page left of organizing my notes before I hit print and had to run and get changed before this. Uh, so there's a lot of like manic energy. The subject matter is particularly gruesome. So that my energy level is even higher. And I'm a little bit excited because I have something that I have not been telling you for a week and it's been very upsetting. So I'm excited because this is also the first time I'm going to get to use this phrase um, from me. It usually comes from you. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, Nick Myers, friend of the podcast. Oh, very nice. Um, he also, I will point out, uh, shout out to his wife, Allie. She's also oh. very lovely. Yeah. Um, so... Nick and a friend of his uh, make some videos. They have a uh, Instagram account and a uh, TikTok. They're quite, they're really getting some views on TikTok right now. And uh, he thought he's a listener of the show and he just thought, you know what, what would be more fitting than for a fellow Moose Javian to, uh, be my first hat. So Shut up. To the lovely gentleman at Leroy and Leroy. <laughs> oh my God, it's glorious. Christy, uh, Christy is officially rocking her first, her first merch hat. So. Wow. I will link to Leroy and Leroy. Uh, but yeah, that's where we're at right now. So there, I've been holding this out from you from like a week. So it's been very upsetting for me. <laughs> Listen, it was a glorious reveal. I'm glad that I all, all of the listeners could be a part of it with me so that I can yeah. feel it in the moment with all of yeah. them. Wow, it's a beautiful sky blue. It's got a yeah. very kind of sassy font. Yeah. This is I, nice. This is a nice item. It, today might not be the appropriate episode to be like, and I'm in a hat. But guess what? Manic well, you know energy, what? it's it's raised up. Of I wanted to wear it as soon, like the first episode after I got it. So I'm like, well. Well, you know what I'm realizing? Because this is this is uncharted territory for us. Because we've been talking about hats a lot. And this is the first yeah. one we've received. Maybe you wear it for the first bit. Because, you know, we, we chat for the first bit. And then when we get into the, to the case, maybe then you remove the hat. <laughs> Fair enough. A, you know what? Like as though you're having a nice meal. You when you sit down at the table, yeah. to, you remove the hat. When we're that when we're right. sitting to talk about the murder, <laughs> you take it off. You know what I mean? Yep. I think that might be a nice tradition because yeah. we're starting it today. It's up to us. Sky's the limit as to what's yeah. going to happen, and I just yeah, my brain is all over the place. So I don't know what I don't know what everyone's about to get, but well, I know listen. it's starting off with a hat. <laughs> Well, you look adorable. Thank you to oh, Nick. Thank you. thank you to Leroy and Leroy. Make sure you check out that link in our uh, on our Instagram for sure, because it yeah. will be there. Uh, can't wait. Can't wait for more hats to come in. I hope that this is this is the you know, I hope that this starts kind of the avalanche. And I'm realizing oh, also people are going to yeah. ask us, where can we send these? And we don't have a P.O. box yet. And I think that this is probably the time we probably just one. need to get one. We're going to get one. Yeah, we're going to. And one. then we're just going to see what happens. We're going to see what happens. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, listen, uh, you know, we're not ones to keep secrets from one another, but this felt very justified and it was a, a glorious yeah. reveal. I'm yeah, so it happy. Felt, it, it felt right. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, now, just just to speak to a second, <clears throat> for some reason, I am also, I think it's, you know, obviously, as as you probably know, well, you know, if you've clicked on the episode, we are going to be talking about Jean Benet Ramsey in this episode of the show. And um, we have a we have a fairly solid track record on True Crime and Cocktails that when we are talking about a young victim, we we are very we're we uh, what's the best word um, mania sets in. Um, it's mm-hmm. a, just a deep discomfort. Yeah, obviously it's uh, it's unsettling. They're all mm-hmm. again. I want to reiterate, all of the cases are unsettling, but children. I think for the both of us, it's as I'm sure it is for many people, it's just a very sensitive uh, place. Yeah. So I have also been in a tizzy all day to the point that, you know, we had set a time that we were going to do this. And then like an hour before I was like, oh, we, we should push it. And then long story short, it was like 10 minutes before we we're supposed to go. And, <laughs> and Christy texts me and is like, are you, are you going to be ready? And I just sent a picture back completely wet in towels. <laughs> like, nope. And I think my subconscious today was just like not letting me get right because normally, of course, we're we're raring to go, but yeah. I was dragging my heels on this one. Mm-hmm. Um, but the good news is, is that you know, dry January is over, so nothing like a child murder to bring out the sailor Jerry rum. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you know a white claw won't cut it, um, yeah, sailor Jerry and diet Dr Pepper could be terrible, could be great. Who knows? But we're going to give it a go and just mm-hmm. see, just see where it leads us. What are you drinking yeah. over there? Uh, well, I've decided I'm doing like a throwback to episode three, I believe. I've brought back the dirty Slurpee. Heck yes. That's Which nice. would be uh, a frozen Pombe that mm. I found in the closet I apparently had a couple and I was like, Ooh, I should get them in there. You don't want to put them in too early or then it's hard and then you can't drink it at all. So I put them both in, went to get them. One is frozen. One is completely not frozen somehow. So I'm just, it just, I'll get, I'll get the other one in the break. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm already, I'm already uncomfortable. Um, yeah. I'm already very manic. I, mm-hmm. I have spent, a lot of hours this week in in the details of this case like yeah nine hours alone were just documentaries wowzer and then i spent a large afternoon going through youtube watching like interviews with the family and police interrogation tapes that were on youtube somehow and then i read three books that had just like a couple chapters in each of these books were about the case but then last night <laughs> At 2 a.m., I discovered like an AMA, an Ask Me Anything, um, on Reddit by a cop who was part of the case. And people were talking about his book. And I was like, ah, shit. Well, got to find that. So I bought his ebook and I started reading it at like two in the morning. And then he kept referencing another cop's book. So guess what? <laughs> oh, no. So it was a very late bedtime and a very early morning reading these two books very last minute and then so organizing my notes. And so it's, oh, and it should be noted because, because I felt it was relevant to the case. Yeah. I made my husband sit through the 1996 Mel Gibson movie ransom with me. (laughs) So I, I, I've put in like a solid, probably 13 plus hours of just video watching for this episode and ransom will come up in my notes so don't think i didn't learn a thing or two listen i never (laughs) questioned it never could never would yeah that is that's wow that feels like it could be a record um yeah i did say last episode that i thought that i had over researched but apparently that was just foreshadowing to this week (laughs) yeah yeah, that, that, feels uh, right. that feels it's just right. a case of all. There's a lot of like one thing will say one thing, one thing says something else, and then you're like, which one's real? So you have to then hunt down where's the multiple sources that are going to say which way I'm supposed to go. And right. uh, the case is maddening. Yeah, <laughs> it's just maddening. There's so many things that I want to. Well, I think scream that's why about, it's but... still is on people's minds. And I, you know, yeah. because we obviously put out an all call on our our socials asking, you know 
what's a case you want us to talk about? And truly the number one answer was JonBenet Ramsey. It really, yeah. it's, it's, it really does kind of speak to how maddening it is um, that it's still, again, it's still on people's minds so many years later, you know? And then I, you know, there's a couple of people also who I know reached out and said, you know, why bother? Haven't we already gone through all of it? And, and you know, I said, I said at the time, and I will say it again, that I do believe um, in in any case, but but certainly, um, again, the ones of children, I think it is important to, to keep talking about them and to keep keep those names alive in the hopes that a new set of eyes will see something new that can lead to something. Because ultimately, of course, I think the goal for any, I think, you know, true true crime lover is because you want to get justice for these, these terrible things, um, and for the victims. So, um, I do think it's an important, an important thing to keep, to keep, uh, her name and, and the names of all the, the people that we talk about alive, uh, in the hopes that again, who knows, something can lead to something. And then, you know, maybe <laughs> true crime and cocktails cracks the case. I mean, that is the ultimate dream. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, yes, of course, obviously to give them, the justice they deserve but man it would make me feel amazing for the amount of research like i do i want to know that that mel gibson movie was the key all along totally i also was meant to watch a specific johnny depp movie i didn't get the chance so i had to google more about it because i only had 20 minutes i did not have the hour and a half but it also feels relevant so it's coming up so again It just takes the right person to say something, to spark it, an idea in somebody else. And before you know it, case solved. Exactly. And if it takes a problematic actor like Mel Gibson or Johnny Depp, we're willing to to take that hit. You know what I'm saying? Because again, it is all about, you know, at the end of the day, all jokes aside, it is it is all about, you know, trying to find justice for these people who obviously can't fight for themselves. Yeah. Um, but we were talking about what we wanted to to discuss. And it's funny because Christy reminded me of this and I completely forgot that I was a child model. <laughs> yeah, you were. She brought this up and I was like, oh yeah, I I was. That's that's so true. Um, so here's a little something that I think that uh, listeners may find interesting about old Lauren Ash. I was painfully shy, like to a point that it was actually kind of becoming a problem, Um, which I know seems impossible because I'm, you know, very, very loud now uh, and obviously quite gregarious. But uh, yeah, so when I was a little, little kid, my mom had this idea uh, in our small town, shout out to Belleville, Ontario. Um, She was like, she signed me up for modeling classes and I will give Laurel credit, my mother, that it it did kind of bring me out of my shell. And so I remember I kind of started going to these classes and then I, I started meeting other ki- little kids and I was pretty young. I think I was like four or five. Um, but I think she was really worried because honestly, like I was terrified of men specifically, which, you know, I wish some of that instinct could have maybe carried over to my like, in, well, at least to my mid thirties. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't always had the best instincts anyway. Um, but yeah, so I think it was like a concern that it was like, what's going to happen at school if she has to be around a male sure. teacher or a principal or something. And she's, you know, running and hiding in fear. Um, so anyway, so I, I really did kind of blossom at these, these modeling classes. And then we started doing like little runway shows and we started doing the, the, the mall circuit. So, you know, we'd all, a bunch of us models would like pile in a car and then we'd, we'd go and do the, the, the runways. I also did some bridal shows, uh, as a, as a flower girl. Now I did have my own flower girl dress and for some reason they were okay with that. I don't know what these shows were trying to sell. I don't know. Maybe just the, maybe just the wedding dresses. I don't know. Um, that feels like a missed opportunity then. Doesn't it feel like maybe put her in something else that's for sale? Yeah. I don't know. Weird. Um, but I do remember, I don't know why we stopped. I do know that it was becoming a lot. And I think maybe it was one of those things where it had kind of served its purpose. I was becoming, you know, I was kind of coming out of my shell. And then it was shortly after that when I was seven. And I think I may have told this story on here before that I was in 
front of a video camera for the first time and I lit up and became another child and was doing an impression of Robin Leach, uh, Lifestyles of the Poor and Boring instead of Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, which again, I think is a very Amazing. smart joke. And then I think it was like a year later that I was starring in my first school play. So again, I will give credit that the modeling classes really did. It was, I, she was right. I'll give it to her that I, I needed that confidence boost or something. I don't know. Um, and then of course it led down the road to, as an adult, making terrible choices with men, but that's neither here nor there. I can't directly correlate that to the modeling one way or the other, you know? Sure. <laughs> sure. We're already giving <laughs> positivity to the modeling. Yeah. So we don't want to like also knock it down. No. And, and but... the other thing I will say, because I realized I should also say this because Jean Benet was obviously like a beauty queen. I was yeah. also in pageants. I did get into pageants as well. I often won most photogenic. You're very welcome. Of course um, you did. And I remember getting like coached to do my like uh, talent portion and like how I would talk to the judges and stuff, but it was very low level. Like it was local only. Like we never kind of took it to the next level. Sure. I was never in the kind of toddlers and tiaras type looks or anything like that. Um, but I did win. And I also will say too, like I was also oblivious at the time because I remember being very good friends with like the other girls in my category and like one of them beat me. And I think it was like, kind of, I kind of didn't even clue in like, I really like just kind of liked it. Like it was like fun and I liked wearing the dress and like looking pretty and yeah, again, it paid off. But anyway, so as we were discussing this, Christy and I were discussing this earlier over text. Um, and I was, I was telling her about this, that I was like, this is why, and, and that, that Laurel did this. And she was like, oh, I didn't realize this. Well, Christy, Christy also had a revelation, which is what a lot of this show is about too. Like it's a, you know, true crime and cocktails, working things out, um, revelations about our lives. Uh, yeah. you know, our, our dual therapy we're doing here. And um, you maybe had a bit of a different kind of experience uh, uh with, with maybe performance-based things. Yes. I mean, as a, as a child, like specifically like younger, younger child, um, we, sometimes we would for fun rent a video camera. I don't even remember from where we did that, but we'd rent a video camera for the weekend. And then it's like, ah, you kids go on and make your own videos. And, if you go back and watch those videos, it's a very, very string bean Christy, which is hard to believe, but just very string bean, strawberry blonde hair. And I'm bouncing around and I'm like just anything to have my face in front of that camera. And then when like around the time I was like seven or eight, I used to perform shows for my parents in the living room. I would send them a little paper invite and be oh, like, come on, living room. 7 p.m. They'd come upstairs. There would be bowls of chips. Like I was, I was ready. And then I would put on, uh, I had a little uh, cassette player and I would put on Alvin and the Chipmunks tapes and I would lip sync and dance my own routine to them. And I felt alive. I loved it so much. And I was just like, look at me. I'm performing. This is amazing. Yeah. Even in like, I'm going to say the fifth grade, I think, I was one of the leads in the Christmas play. What? How did I never know this? Because it's actually really embarrassing that I just said it was a lead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really recall the story, but essentially it was some sort of Christmas story about a cow. And <laughs> I was the front half of the cow. So I uh, had to wear this very large paper mache hat head that I believe like the older grade made for us. And it was like held up with these two sticks. And then, so it was on my head and I had to bend over the whole time and just walk around. And a friend of mine, I believe it was my friend, Dana, shout out to Dana. Um, and she had to hold on to my hips and she was the back end and there was a sheet over us. And so we had to like choreograph our footsteps. Now the play was circled, like was around this cow, based on this cow. So that's oh. how I say I was the lead. I had no lines. No, I think we mooed once, but that's not the point. But I was here for it. You never saw my face, but I was on stage. I was dancing. I was like, yeah. And then just the other way. Like suddenly I'm not like you put a camera in my face. I'm like, no, thanks. And suddenly it's just like, 
not interested. So I think after that, the more times we moved, the more I was like, I don't want spotlight anymore. And suddenly it got to the point where around the time we were starting this podcast, I was Lauren at three or four. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say the podcast is maybe your modeling classes? I would say that. Um, I also, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I, when I say I was you, I was like painfully shy, very introverted. Um, I, I didn't fear men. <laughs> I think we all, all know that. I know that. Yeah. Um, if you've heard the show before. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, but it was just, it's just amazing to me that I was like, I was just bubbly and like had to be a performer and then just over the years was like, nope, nope, I'm good. I'm good over here. You guys go. I'll just stay here. Whereas I love that I went that direction and you went the other direction and now we're somehow meeting in the middle Yeah, to see what's going to happen. It feels very right. Yeah. It feels very right. Yeah. Well, what's happening is, is, you know, we're talking about murders and yep. you're wearing hats that we've shamelessly solicited from strangers and acquaintances on the internet. So <laughs> that's that it somehow all makes sense. Somehow yeah. it all makes sense. But I did yeah. think that that was so fascinating that it, it does feel like, you know, that you, I, cause I've said to you before in private and I'll say it to you in public now, I just think you were born to do this and it's clear that you were and you just took a little hiatus for a little while. That's all it was. That, it was. Uh, that is beautiful to say. I mean, the way I'm feeling about some of the words that I'm going to end up saying tonight, I don't know if I'm born for it. <laughs> more of the like you know the In personality yeah, the, yeah. the talking you know the the promo videos we've made you've been very funny um those oh, kinds of things God. so yeah those things yeah the, no i don't know that anyone's really born to um <laughs> yeah. talk about child murder i don't know that that's no. anybody's forte i don't life. even know how many people are born for promos because let me tell you the first time you sent me a script i just went wait oh shit there's acting <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, okay. But like, nobody's going to see this. And it's like, oh yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there. It's out there. Someday I'm going to end up posting the outtakes. Oh yeah. You need to. I it's, it's horrifying. It's just like, I think a solid 20 of minutes of me trying to read a line and then going, oh fuck. Nope. Nope. That didn't work. Like, and then just bursting out laughing because I'm like, nope, I don't know what's happening. And my life is surreal. Listen. You know, ever since I was the front half of that cow. <laughs> <laughs> it was all leading to this. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> I am so happy to be the back end this time. <laughs> oh, I don't even fully know what that means. <laughs> I'm the ass of the cow in this operation and we both damn well know it. Don't try, don't try to fight me on that. Yeah. We got a lot of listeners that'll agree with me. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, thank goodness for, for all of our, our upbringings and the things that let us here see, this is it because I'm now I'm trying, I'm like, this isn't a natural segue. It's a natural mm -hmm. segue mm -hmm. to get into the whole thing. And I'm just dragging my heels. Yeah. I think it's time to it's remove time. the hat. <laughs> I'll, uh, I will bring it back. Yep. For the uh, last call. Oh, no. <laughs> no well, well, it is what it is. Well, you got it. I guess you put it on pretty tight. I did. <laughs> because I wanted it secure. And now. Well, well, I'm the one who is coming up with traditions. And I think you'll feel better about it, though, if you see a clip of you talking very seriously about the case <laughs> that you don't have, have a hat on. <laughs> yes. I, I think I, I'm, uh, I'm just protecting you. I'm protecting you from future, you know. I will. It'll come back. I'll bring it back uh, for the last call later on. Yeah, the last call episodes that are featured on our Patreon. If you haven't checked that out yet already, feel Smooth. free. A lot mm -hmm. of fun. I try to slip it in. You know, you don't want to make it too over, too overt. But anyway, it was nice. All right, thank you. Um, so as we've already talked about this episode, we will be discussing, of course, the very, very tragic death of Jean Benet Ramsey. For those of you who want a little bit of a recap, because it had been a while for me since I remembered the details of this case. 
In 1996, Patsy Ramsey woke up the day after Christmas and found a ransom note claiming that her daughter had been kidnapped. Seven hours later, Patsy's husband, John, would find their six-year-old daughter, Jean Bonnet, dead in the basement of their home. A special police investigator blamed an intruder. However, most police officers and the general public have always believed that the Ramseys were involved. What happened to Jean Bonnet and how is her case still unsolved more than 20 years later? Ooh, that's the question. That's the question mm -hmm. we're all trying to figure out, right? So, <clears throat> I mean, where do we even begin? Obviously, you know, this is one that, uh, I, as we've already kind of t touched on, there's so, I just remember, I remember it being so big at the time. And I remember yeah. like not knowing a lot of the details because I feel like 96, I was 13. So I feel like we were like, I was like aware of it because it was such a massive story. I feel like you, yeah. whether you wanted to be aware of it or not, you kind of were. Um, and I just remember the, like the craze, but I don't think I ever really knew the details until I was an adult. And then I'm sure I saw one, one of the documentaries, uh, possibly something that you watched in the past uh, week. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's just so, there's so many twists and turns. There's so mm -hmm. many frustrations along the way. Uh, and listen, uh, I, I, we're, we'll just get into it, but a lot of, a lot of suspicion around that family, whether, whether you, yeah. whether they're guilty or innocent, there's, there's been a lot of suspicion. Now, Patsy of course has passed Yes, as of now. So she has, she, she did pass of ovarian cancer. She sadly. did. Yes. Um, now is it, this is my, my only question. And then I'll just let you get into it. Did her dad, did Jean Benet's dad pass as well? I thought that he no. had, he's still alive. Okay. He is still alive. And I have a, as fun as it gets in this episode, I will have a fun trivia about him later on that. Oh. Uh, so if you get low thinking this episode's a bit heavy and hard to handle, remember, I have a, a fun trivia that really surprised me <laughs> coming oh. up later in the show. So cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool it's starting oh, just it's starting chug a lug you know what i mean yep. we just gotta we gotta drink this one fun yep. um all right so the other major players of course there was jean benet's brother burke who was nine at the time jean benet yep. of course was six at the time of her death oh awful and it should also be noted that john uh jean benet's dad had two other children from a previous relationship a son yes. and a daughter um, John Andrew and Melinda. So that's the major players. That's the synopsis. Let's get into it. Tell me what you got for me. All right. So uh, Jean Benet Ramsey, born in Atlanta in August of 1990. Her name is a portmanteau. For those uh, aren't who may not be familiar with the phrase, it basically just means her name is literally a combination of her father's first and middle names, because he is John Bennett, and she is Jean Bennet. Um, people said she was like sweet, smart, funny. She excelled in math, fascinated by nature, enjoyed riding her bike, loved cats and dogs. Uh, she had her brother, as you had mentioned. Her father, or I should say their father, uh, John Ramsey, was the president of Access Graphics. He was previously married in, 19, in 1966 to a woman named Lucinda. They had three children. Oh. Elizabeth, Melinda, and John Andrew. I'm not sure when the other two girls were born, but John Andrew was born in 1976. Then... Shortly after her, uh, that child was born, John Ramsey had an affair. <laughs> oh. Um, and it came out. So Lucinda filed for divorce in 1977. Uh, then in 1992, uh, his oldest daughter, Beth, died in a car accident. Oh. I believe she was 22 at the time. So if I do oh. that quick math, she was 1970 then, which right. I didn't do before this, because again, <laughs> I'm manic. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that we're here and dressed is yeah, really all that and, anybody can ask for. And get this, I'm in pants. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, we'll see what happens <laughs> in 90 minutes. It won't last. <laughs> uh, so in 1980, John married Patsy Ramsey, 
At the time, John was 36 years old and Patsy was 23. Oh. Which feels, I mean, they made it work, but that's just still an unsettling. uh, So she was like the age of his daughters. Like his daughters. Um, Oh, she was like about 10 years older. Oh, okay. My math. (laughs) No, it's okay. Gonna, it's okay. I threw a lot of numbers at you. Nope. I'm going to stop trying to do math. It's I threw numbers at you. I should have. Nummy, nummy, gluggy, gluggy. <laughs> so uh, Patsy in 1977 was Miss West Virginia. So she was big on the like beauty pageant circuit. Uh, they moved to Boulder, Colorado in 1991. They lived in a 6,700 square foot mansion, which wow. is insane. Um, they had a vacation house in Michigan. They had a boat and two private planes. So because I assume it was Patsy's initial idea, but Jean Bonnet gets entered into the pageant world. Um, she won like Little Miss Colorado, uh, Sunburst National Pageant, Colorado State All-Star Kids Cover Girl, all of these things. Two weeks before her death, on December 17th, she was crowned Little Miss Christmas, which I feel is very lovely. And if I had known existed, I would have entered you. Oh, would have been an honor. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, People kind of felt that Patsy was living vicariously through her daughter because her Miss America dreams uh, were over and she... John Bonet just kind of seemed to gravitate to it. She seemed a natural, ha- had just this natural talent to her. And so she just clung to that and was like, let's get her out there. Right. Some of Patsy's friends were concerned uh, with the heavy makeup, elaborate costumes, and a recent platinum dye job. Uh, so they planned to have a talk with her after the holidays to be like, you're going too far. Obviously, they uh, didn't get to uh, have that conversation. Oh, wow. One time, somebody saw all of the trophies in Jean Bonnet's room, and her quote was, oh, yeah, the trophies are more my mom's, which is, I think, an amazing insight coming from a six-year-old. Yeah. That it was like she real. even understood that it was like, oh, yeah, this is more my mom's thing. I just do it for fun, whatever. You know, the one thing I wanted to say, and I hope I'm not already stepping on your notes, but Mm. because I did a a very little Googling um, over the past week on this, but the thing that I remember at the time of her death and that I remember again now, how many photo shoots was this little girl doing? There are so many different looks. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, and and (laughs) as a former child mom, as a former child model. Um, yeah. No, I didn't go anywhere near as far as she did. But it was like, I think I maybe did one photo shoot where we had maybe like three looks. And I feel like Jean Bonnet at six must have had, I don't know, 50 looks or 100 looks. Like, I just feel like every time you see a photo of her, it, it was a different look. And it was just wild yeah. to me that there was, because A, obviously that's a lot of money. But if they have two private planes, I'm hearing that that's probably they not They were an millionaires. Issue. Yeah, yeah. And B, it's just like, who has the time? But I guess, I guess you make time if that's your, if that's your passion. Yeah. I mean, Patsy at one point did say that the whole beauty pageant thing was just like a fun Sunday afternoon thing. But then people pointed out that they were putting like hundreds of thousands of dollars into this and that it was taking up like all of their time because they have to travel to different places for these competitions. And then there's the practicing for all of this and like, there was, it was beyond more than a single day a week that they would have been doing this. And yeah, the costumes are so elaborate and like shout out to that seamstress because I've seen a few documentaries where they interviewed her and I was just like, did somebody at least comment about how great she did on those costumes? Cause they're fantastic. Wild. And I know some people are very uncomfortable with those costumes. They don't like seeing someone so young, parading around in something like that. And I'm going to, to those people, I'm going to say, well, same, (laughs) but, (laughs) but I'm also like, if that's something that your child is into and that you're into no shame on you for that. Like, that's just, some people are comfortable with it. Some aren't again, I can't get in front of a camera without being just like a little bit physically ill. I don't have the bucket beside the desk anymore, just in case. (laughs) 
but it doesn't mean I don't think about it often. Um, but my point being like, I, I get it. I'm, I'm unsettled with just, just how much makeup those kids were wearing and like shoving the kids out in the public eye. And there are a lot of people who are like, I think whoever did this was somebody who saw her from the pageant world. And, and it's like, well, that's not her fault. And it's like, well, no, it's not her fault that someone saw her and became obsessed with her, but there's still a level of like, maybe don't put her out there. Well, absolutely. And it also becomes like a bigger kind of like societal systemic thing too. I yeah. just watched the new Britney Spears documentary last oh. night, which is a must watch hashtag free Britney for real. Um, but it, it, it very quickly, not to derail, but it talks about when she first hit because she really was the first girl at that time. Cause it was, it was the boy band craze, right? You're so right, like Backstreet right. Boys, NSYNC, et cetera. And Britney was the first girl and she blew up with hit me baby one more time. Mm -hmm. And nobody kind of knew what to make of her. And so the people that kind of quote created her, you know, pushed this kind of sex image, this school girl who's still sexy. Then she started being destroyed for that. That it was like, oh, yeah. she, it, the same kind of thing where it was like, you know, this is sending the wrong message and she's so young and this is inappropriate, et cetera. And then it was like, it was like, but wait a minute, like you, but you made her this way. Like she was created yeah. that way. And then she's being, and then there was like, she was getting death threats. And I mean, it's, it, it is a good watch if you haven't watched it. And you know, while watching it, it's so sad. And I read a tweet actually that was very prolific and accurate, which was as you watch it, it feels like you're watching a true crime documentary because it feels like you're watching something about someone who has passed away because she yeah. has in many ways lost literally um, all autonomy autonomy over her own life, which again, that's a whole other story. We don't, I don't want to derail us that far, but I do think it connects to this whole, the toddlers and tiaras, the, the girls and yeah. beauty pageants where it's like, yes, should, should we be doing that with children? Probably not. But again, at that time also, like that was, people were doing that and I'm not defending it at all, but it's like, it is a bigger kind of like, you know, societal yeah. systemic, you know, thing that I, I feel like there is a, a much larger push away from now, but I, I am also certain that I'm sure those pageants still exist in, in places. And in, Oh, in I'm the sure they're huge. The States. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's yeah. still a huge thing, but it's just such conflicting yeah. messages, right? Because it's like, yes, you're told one thing, but you're told that, you know, you're supposed to be pretty and cute and sexy, but then you can't be too pretty or cute and sexy. Like it's very confusing. And anyway, I don't. And the joke is they just never stop putting that whole umbrella over top of all women and people who identify as female. Yes, absolutely. Just everybody. It's always like, well, you aren't pretty enough. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, what are you trying to be too pretty? Like it's, it's never enough. So I will. It's like, okay, yes. one, one last derailing, no, please. one last derailing. Yeah. Do you know what one of my biggest pet peeves is? Oh. And don't come for me, men, because I know that your heart's are in the right place. But when men say things like, I just really prefer a woman without makeup. I just really prefer, I'm like, I hear you. I hear you. And I know that your heart is in the right place. And you're trying to say like natural is more beautiful, but it's like, but then at the same time, we're, we, we've been watching movies since birth where we're watching, you know, beautiful celebrities who are completely unattainable, who look a certain way. And some women like me, like I like wearing a certain amount of makeup and it isn't due to insecurity or comparing myself to them. But then I all of a sudden start equating it with that where I'm like, well, I guess this is part of my programming that I feel like that. And then I start feeling like shit for liking to wear something because then I'm like, and then I'm like, but wait a minute, maybe it isn't that programming. And now you trying to be nice to me has made me feel worse. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. My yeah, point being it. is just, I feel like, like, I, I feel like it just, just stop making opinions, I guess is the point. Just let us be like what women, whatever, yeah. whatever that a specific woman wants yeah. to be, let her be it. Just let her. And that, that has beauty within itself. Whatever that person's own thing is. If it's no makeup, beautiful. If it's makeup, great. You know? Yeah. I mean, if they need to, to follow that, if they need some sort of like thing to think about, to know if, how they should respond. Um, if, uh, if a woman is happy, bop, bop, bop. no more is need, no more is needed. Yeah. If she's happy, just let it go. Yeah. 
you know, we, yeah. that's, that's all we want. We want, well, I mean, obviously we want cases to get solved. We just want people to be happy. Yes. Happy being who they are, not feeling exactly. physically ill about the thought of, I don't think I can leave the house until I put on a full face. If you want to put on a full face before you leave the house, go ahead. I uh, used to be, oh, I have to make sure I'm not in anything that could possibly con be conceived as pajamas. The other day, uh, my husband was like, we're just going to run out to the store really quick. And I said, okay, I'm just debating, do I put on warmer pajamas or <laughs> stay in these ones because it was very cold outside? Because it was like, yeah, I'm just literally running in somewhere for two minutes. So that's, I've dropped down to like, yeah. oh, it's good enough. Um, and then I always follow it with, I'm married. Why do I care? <laughs> yeah. Listen. And you know what? I'm just saying, it is all you need is. to say to somebody is you're beautiful. You don't need to say you're more beautiful one way or another. Just embracing yes. that, that how a woman chooses to present herself and whatever that is, finding the beauty there and not, and not saying that it's better one way or another. Don't put that in your partner's head. Don't, you know what I mean? Yes. Even if you think you're being nice, just, just don't just tell them they look great. That's all. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. That's nice. Right. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I know it's coming from a good place. I'm not, but anyway. Yeah. Oh, back to the child murder. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter how many times we. I just get uh, off. I want to get into like, a long move. talk about yeah. systemic misogyny. You know. <laughs> we uh yeah we we because we know we're now getting to like we're getting the details the, of the yeah. of the event mm -hmm. and now we're both just like ah. Uh, Okay. Tell me more about this documentary about Brittany, know. you know, like it's really this. moving. That's no, where we're okay. at. Yeah. No, this mm -hmm. is important. This is important. We can it do is. this. Okay. Okay. So December 26th, 1996, um, around five 30 in the morning, Patsy gets up, she gets dressed, does her hair and makeup heads downstairs. There is a spiral staircase that leads from her bedroom to the kitchen and she gets part way down and she sees three pieces of paper laid across the stairs. Um, she picks them up, reads the first couple of lines and it says something about, we have your daughter. So she screams for her husband. Um, she runs up to John Bonet's room, sees that it's empty at 5 52 AM. She calls 911 uh, at 5 54 she then calls her family friends, the Fernies and the Whites. She wants them, she just calls them screaming. John Bonet is someone, she's been kidnapped, she's been taken. I need you to come over. 5.59, the first officer arrives on the scene, which I think is amazing that they got there in seven minutes. Yeah. And the every single documentary and thing that I've like read and watched about this is like, just remember, it's the day after Christmas. So they're not going to have as many staff around. And so it's just, and it's insanely early in the morning. So this is, I mean, kudos to this officer for getting there. Um, so around 6.30, uh, the family friends arrive, CSI arrives, and uh, victims advocates arrive. Um, one of the family friends, uh, Fleet White, checks the house his daughter had gone missing like a couple of years before and he was so frantic and he went running up and down the house screaming her name. Turns out she was in the house and she was hiding, but he kind of just went into that mode again, was like tearing around the house, went all over looking for her and was like screaming for her. Uh, he got to the wine cellar in the basement, opened it, uh, but it's got no windows and the light switch is like, really low down for a light switch, like almost waist high. So he couldn't see or find the light switch. So he like kind of glanced in and went, okay, nothing there, whatever, closed the door, kept going on. He went downstairs into um, what's what was known as like the train room where Burks had a train set. And uh, he moved, there was a blue suitcase there. He moved it out of his way to like look around. He moved the suitcase back to a different spot that will come into play momentarily. Um, so an officer had arrived or a detective had arrived. Um, and she said approximately between 10 30 AM and 12 PM, she had no clue where John Ramsey was the family and the friends and, a, uh, 
Reverend had showed up to help support them. They were all like mingling around in the house. And she said, this detective said she at no point in that hour and a half could account for John Ramsey. She never saw him at any point. Uh, So around one o'clock, John has like around this, John has now reappeared. And she's like, you know what? She can see that John is getting really anxious. He's getting nervous. So she says, you know what? We're going to search this house so thoroughly, top to bottom. We're going to start at the top. Why don't you go start looking too to help us? So John grabs his friend Fleet and is like, Kate, we're going downstairs. And they go into the train room and there's a broken window. And John explains months ago, he left his key. He couldn't get in the house. So he broke the window himself to get into the house. Right. Um, And then they go to the wine cellar. He opens the door and immediately screams, oh my God, it's John Bonet. I just want to, we will get into this a bit more later, but I just want to point out. So this room is black. There are no windows whatsoever. It's also a door that you pull towards you to open. So you're, you, you have to step into the room to even see anything. But he like opened the door and was like, oh my God, there she is. Which is amazing because his friend did that just hours earlier and saw nothing because it was just black. And when you look in the blackness, you just see like something white and it was the blanket that was covering her. Right. So they see this, they see her in this blanket. They take the blanket off. She has a a nylon cord that's wrapped around both of her wrists and around her neck. Her hands are above her head. Uh, She has a piece of tape across her mouth. So he, John rips the tape off of her mouth, tries to loosen the ties that are around her wrists he gets one wrist free and then he just picks her up and brings her upstairs uh his friend fleet then like runs and picks up the tape to bring it up to the police so john brings her upstairs and just in the living room where there's like coffee table and multiple couches he lays her on the floor basically underneath the christmas tree which i felt was such a weird choice and then one, the, uh, the detective who was there at the time uh, didn't like where she was. So she picked up Jean Bonnet and moved her slightly. And then they realized, oh, Patsy's going to come in. We can't have Patsy see this. So they, he quickly, John grabs a blanket and tosses it on the body. So the amount of cross-contamination that has now happened uh, is insane. Um, so... The night before this all happened, the Ramseys had gone to the White's house for a Christmas dinner. They arrived home just after 9 p.m. and they were getting up really early that morning because the plan was they were going to go on the private plane, fly to Michigan, and John's older two children were going to join them there for like a Christmas celebration. And then days later, they were going to come back home and go on a Disney cruise. So they had they had plans of things that they, that they were going to be doing. So that's, I'm going to say right out straight out right now. I don't believe that this was premeditated, but we'll get further into that. Sure. So when Patsy first gets this ransom note, she calls 911, right? You can find the 911 call on various places. I will do my best to get a copy of the call and put it with the case file. Yeah. On truecrimeandcocktails.com. Enjoy it. Um, one thing to note is like when it, when this happened, this was 1996. So technology wasn't a hundred percent. It's could be even better now than it is, but now it's considerably better. So the recording of the call, you hear like a lot of static in a lot of places, but people have had sound engineers kind of take some of that static out so you could hear it better. At the very, very beginning, there's like some static and then she just, Patsy screams police. But before that, I swear she says, we need Anne, as though she's saying we need an ambulance, but then corrects herself and then says police. Doesn't seem like it's anything, but I'm like, it just felt like she had her story wrong. Yeah. So during this call, Patsy, of course, is hysterical. Um, She says there's a kidnapping. She refers to herself as the mother. Um, She never once says John Bonet's name. She refers to her as her daughter and just simply describes her. Like she, at one point she just says, well, she's six. 
blonde, blonde, six. And like, never says her name, never says anything that is like, it's, it, this is my daughter, this is her name, whatever. And it was, I'm the mother is a really weird way of saying it. And yeah. they say there's this thing called distance, din- mm-hmm. distancing language. Um, so it's phrasing that people use to distance themselves from a statement, either to avoid thinking about the subject or just to distance themselves from the content. Um, it could mean that somebody is lying, but it also maybe she just couldn't let her brain think that her daughter had been kidnapped at this point. So she, that's why she was like, I'm the mother can't really think about, I am her mother. Right. Um, so usually when you make a 911 call and you're like, I need the police or an ambulance or whatever, you make the call, you stay on the line until they are like, help has arrived. Right. And then you can hang up. Well, at one point out of nowhere, Patsy hangs up the phone. She thought she hung up the phone. She kind of hangs it up. And so the woman, um, her name was Kim Archuleta. She was the 911 operator. She said that you could hear something going on. So she stayed on the line, hoping for more. And she believes she heard Patsy go from like super hysterical screaming to very calmly saying, we've called the police. Now what? She also said she felt like the entire phone call was very rehearsed and she swears there were three voices throughout the call. So multiple different documentaries have got sound engineers to like go in, see if they can take out some of this distortion, see what they can do. Right. At one point, um, after she thinks she's hung up the phone, you hear what sounds like a man say, we're not speaking to you. Then you hear what sounds like Patsy again, and it's a it's kind of a toss-up as to what she could be saying. It sounds like either like, help me, Jesus, or what did you do? Which I understand sound completely different, but when you hear it, you'll understand that it's like, yeah, it could possibly go one way or the other. And then you hear a child's voice say, well, what did you find? Uh, th- at the time the 911 call was made, John and Patsy said that Burke was asleep. They said he slept right. through everything. Police came. And by the time that the police were there, it was like 830. And we had, uh, we took Burke to a family friends, but he was asleep that entire time. But there is a neighbor who's like, who said when she first heard this happened, what was going on with Burke? Because he's well known to be an early riser. Like he's up every day at like 530. So I find it very interesting that like they to Patsy's death were like, no, he was nowhere near it. He wasn't involved. So w- one thing we can say at this point is, is that we know from that 911 call now that years later, there's technology to kind of like sound engineers can take away the, the, the fuzz and all of the, whatever, whatever the professional terms are. Yeah. We do know for a fact that there was a child's voice. We don't know that it was, we can't say for sure it was Burke because in a court of law, there's no proof. It's not a video, et cetera. Yes. But there was definitely a child speaking to Patsy, at least, and a man speaking to Patsy on that recording. We know that's a fact. Yes. And it would seem that that would probably be Burke, given what we know. But anyway, yes. so we're just talking about the facts. Cool. Yes. All right. Continue. Um. So that is dealing with her 911 call. Yeah, I want to jump back to the ransom note. Yeah. The ransom note that FBI have said is the weirdest fucking <laughs> note that they have ever received in their history, which is kind of amazing when it's the FBI. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put um, a copy of it. I'll put the original and then like an, um, an easier to read on just one page version on the virtual case file. But it's a real ride, man. Like, it's bananas. Um, There is also a conflicting story because at some points, Patsy said she found the note and then went and checked JonBenet's room. But sometimes she said she checked the room, saw it was empty, headed downstairs looking for her, and then saw the note. Mm. So we'll see. Uh, But the thing of it is, some of the phrasing used in the note are 
pretty similar to various movies. So one part in the note, the line is, quote, if we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. Well, in the 1972 movie Dirty Harry, uh, on a phone call with uh, for over ransom, somebody says, if you talk to anyone, even if it's a Pekingese pissing on a lamppost, the girl dies. They went for an actual breed. They went for a dog. Not the point. Right. Uh, in Dirty Harry, they also just will say a line and repeat, she dies. That happens five times in this ransom note. Uh, Dirty Harry also says, you sound like you need a good rest. You'll need it because I'm going to give you a nice little run this time. Well, the ransom note says the delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you be rested. Um, the note also says, do not attempt to grow a brain, which is a direct quote from the much beloved 1994 hit Speed. That's right. Of mm -hmm. course. Then what movie was playing in the movie theaters in Boulder, Colorado at the time this happened? Well, the 1996 Mel Gibson movie, Ransom. Ransom. <laughs> the ran in the movie Ransom, which yes, I made my husband uh, watch. And then I took screenshots while we had subtitles on so that I could then type out the full note. But the note, like it's so similar to what they ask for. It specifies what size of bills that they wanted. It specifies exactly how they want the luggage, like they want the money packed into specific luggage. Don't notify police. If you do this, we'll kill him. If you do this, we'll kill him. Because in the movie, it was a boy. Right. Um, so the similarities there are crazy. And then there's the similarities to the Nick of Time movie from 1994 starring Johnny Depp. Now, that movie, sto the story centers on an unarmed political faction that kidnaps a six-year-old girl. Uh, one part, it says, uh, you talk to a cop, you even look at a cop, and your daughter's dead, I'll cut her head off. Well, in the note, they mention, if you speak to somebody we don't like, we'll behead her. So beheadings seem like a really crazy thing. Right. Um, in the movie, it starts, you need to listen to me carefully. The uh, ransom note for the Ramsey started, listen carefully. And why do I think maybe that has something to do with anything? Well, the night, uh, I guess it was technically uh, Christmas night at 7.30 p.m. on a Boulder cable channel, Nick of Time was run. So, and to the point where somebody who was staying with a friend of the Ramseys commented that he watched that movie that night. So that's how he knew it was on TV. And he felt it was just a weird coincidence that there happened to be a movie about this kidnapped girl. And then the next morning he heard that this also six-year-old girl was kidnapped. Oh, so wow. So there's a thing. Uh, the was ransom... The amount the amount of money they were asking for really specific and weird too. Yes. And we're, we're just about to get to that. So sorry. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I like your interest. Yeah. There it is. Uh, there are also similarities in that ransom note to the movie ruthless people, as well as to the real life kidnapping of Patty Hearst. Oh, like wording in it. Very similar. So my point, I'm not saying that somebody like sat down and watched these movies and copied all the lines. I'm saying somebody familiar with seeing these things had these things in their mind to know how a ransom note should sound sort of thing. Um, the, the thing about the ransom note in all in total is an expert said 76% of the note was completely unnecessary. All you needed to do was say, we have your daughter. This is the money we want. We will kill her if you talk to anybody. We'll be in contact. A uh, done. It right. this note was three pages long. It just kept going on and on. Um, and that it, doesn't happen, right? Like I think no. I, I read something that the FBI is like they, they we've never seen one this long. Like yeah, it just doesn't it's, happen. It's so weird. Uh right. the specific amount of money that they ask for. Now, the person that they're talking to, like John Ramsey was a millionaire. Like he had money. They asked for $118,000, which seems really weird. Um, 
one of the investigators in the case was like, you know what? To me, that means the perp, if I may, uh, was young. And uh, to a young person, 118,000 is a lot of money. And it's like, true, but then ask for like just 100 or 125. 118 is so weird. And John and Patsy were asked about it. And they're like, oh, yeah, that number means nothing to us. Well, lies. Um, <laughs> John's John's Christmas bonus from work was $118,117.50. So what are the odds of that? Also, records show that in May of 96, Ram John Ramsey had assets worth like $7.3 million and a total net worth of 6.2. So his total liabilities were 1,118,000. So it just feels, what are the odds that the ransom is the exact, like, it's just too close to me. Yeah, that's weird. Um, There's also the note, it misspelled the word business and the word possession. One had too many S's, one didn't have enough. But it were used words like enforcement and countermeasure and told them that they needed to put the money in an attache. Now, I can tell you, I don't think I knew the word attache until probably within the last <laughs> decade, maybe probably less if I'm, you know, being honest. Attache is not like you can say briefcase, say briefcase, say a duffel bag, say whatever. But like it was specifically they wanted them to take they wanted to make sure you take an adequate sized attache to the bank and attache had the appropriate accent on it. But yet they couldn't spell business right. Like it felt too much like someone was trying way too hard and be like, I'm going to make misspellings because I'm going to show that this person is unintelligent and is you know, whatever, but it's like, but then don't use attache. And wasn't it also written on Patsy Ramsey's stationery from in the house? It sure was. Now I know that they're yeah. also, they could say, oh, well, the kidnapper wrote it in the house, but three pages, <laughs> like also, you know, like how long did that take? <laughs> yeah. Well, I did watch a documentary where they all sat around and wrote out the note to show how long it would take. And it was like a 20 some minute thing. And if you're in a hurry, you're not going to be doing that. Um, they also found the pen was a Sharpie that they had used uh, from the house. And they used the notepad, they used the pen, and then put them back exactly where they belonged. And maybe this person has a better memory than me. Mm. But if I went to someone's house for the first time and took a pen from somewhere, I'm probably not going to remember where that pen goes exactly. Well, I guess, yeah, and listen, I may be jumping ahead, but I guess also, like, what's the end game for them to leave this ransom note and then leave her body in the basement? Like, how, what was, what was that grand plan? Um, yeah, a lot of people seem to have the belief of, like, oh, well, obviously, whoever did this left the note with the thought of, that will buy them some time before they find her body and start, like, looking into it. And it's like, you know what else buys you time? Getting the fuck out. Yeah. If things running away. If things yeah. go badly and you get out, you're gone. You're not potentially leaving even more evidence around by writing this really long note, which I will also say, yes, it was the pen. Yes, it was the paper. Uh, but the joke is the police. So they get this handwritten note. The police want handwriting samples from everybody. They ended up getting handwriting samples from 73 different people over the course of the investigation. Um, and the note, they just grabbed the notepads that were in the kitchen and wrote them on there. So they gave those to the police. And when the police looked at it, they flipped through and they were like, oh, I'll be damned. There is a, a few pages into this. There's a paper that says Mr. and Mrs. with like a line that looks like it's a slanted to start Ramsey. So it looks like that was the very first, like it was a test run and that they changed their minds. And then, so it was still attached to the paper. And like, I think they even like tested it to make sure it was actually from that pad. And it officially was, um, where, but the final ransom note was to Mr. Ramsey and only ever mentioned him. I find it fascinating that the first time it was Mr. and Mrs. 
Yeah. But the second time it was like, no, 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 we're only going to go with, with him. And I feel like, I feel like it was done because whoever did it wanted us to think that the bad guy had a thing against Mr. Ramsey. But if they put it to both of them, well, then they might think they have an issue with, with Patsy as well. And it's like, no, no, they're only angry at John. So let's make sure it's just about John. It's just, it's bananas. I I can't so, even. So in terms of all of the samples that they got, did they have yeah. any matches? Like did Patsy's handwriting match? They felt that Patsy's was the closest of anybody else's. There have also been reports that came out that were like, oh, it wasn't even close. Um, but when you look at the samples side by side, it's like there is an eerie similarity. Um, also, uh, the police asked her, they were like, so why is, why would this writing be so familiar to us if it's not yours and her response was oh maybe a woman wrote it as though all women write the same um there there was just a lot going on that note in particular i'm just going to double check and make sure that i've got nope just the letter uh (laughs) I, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i had a note somewhere else not sure where it was um the point is the police had asked her to write down a list of suspects that she thought it could be. And at one point, Patsy like threw all of her friends under the bus, the housekeeper, almost everyone she knew. She's like, these could, these people could have done it. They could have done it. And uh, they noticed at one point she wrote somebody's name that had an A in it, but then went over it and wrote it to try and cover that. She wrote it the same way that it was written throughout most of that ransom note. Uh, Because the, I mean, the writing changes throughout of it. The first like almost page is very shaky and very clearly that someone is either really freaking the fuck out or trying to make their handwriting not look like their handwriting. Right. It goes back and forth between using we and I. Uh, It starts by saying that we are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country it serves. Now, that's insane to me to be like, we are like, again, I have heard if you're going to do something like this, you're going to want to convey power and nothing makes you sound more powerless than being like, we're just small We're nothing. Don't worry about it. Um, But also to say we respect your business, but not the country that it serves is very like, oh, yeah, your business is great. Like somebody who doesn't want his business or his income affected in any way. Right. So, I mean, the whole thing that like they also don't need to go on as long as they do. At one point, it was like, if you go against any of the things we say, if you alter anything, she dies. But then all of a sudden it's like, if you happen to go to the bank early, we're going to be watching. We'll know. So we'll arrange for an earlier uh, delivery of your daughter. But so it's like, so how, what is it? Are they allowed to go against what you're saying? Or do they have to do exactly what you're saying at the time you're saying of doing it? Right. It's just, there are too many. It's just not real. Like it feels like it just, it just isn't. And the the FBI is saying we've literally never seen a ransom note this long yeah. because I read something about like the average ransom note is something like 30 words long or something. Don't quote me on that, but it was something short. And this one was like hundreds and hundreds of words long. Like it just, it's just not, it's just fake. It just is like, it it has to be. Yeah. It also doesn't make any sense. Like if let's say for a second that, that it's real Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. again, you're right. The only explanation would be that this person is trying to quote, either create confusion which to what end or, or throw them off the tracks as they're running away. But again, like to me, that doesn't in the, in the world that we know, and and listen, I think most people listening to this probably have a fairly, um, you know, have, have probably got some knowledge of true crime in general. (laughs) Eh, I don't know that we have ever heard of, of perpetrators, you know, doing those kinds of things. Like that just doesn't really make sense to me. What would make sense to me is a mother writing a letter when she's panicking because she's found her daughter dead in her house. That's what would make sense to me. Yeah. 
I mean, also, I mean, the letter is addressed, Mr. Ramsey, but then later on in the letter, it's like, don't screw up, John. And it suddenly, it, so it goes from being very formal to being like really personal. So again, it's just not consistent. And there is something about that. And I truly think, I don't feel like this was premeditated in any way. So I feel like whatever happened was an accident and that somebody panicked. And I think if that's going to be someone who broke into a home and did this, their instinct is going to be, I need to get out. I don't need to spend another half hour here making things not look. It's like, but you're already, you're potentially leaving behind even more evidence that you were there. Right. So it's just crazy to me of just like, who's doing this? Just stop. And if it was on paper that was from outside the home, that maybe we they pre-wrote it and left it. Maybe I could be more convinced then, but, but considering we know it was Patsy Ramsey's stationery, the person yeah. who had the closest match was Patsy Ramsey. I agree with you. I don't think that her death was premeditated. I think it for sure was an accident, but I definitely also don't think that that letter was real. I just don't think it could be. It can't be. It can't be. I mean, you're right. If they had brought it in from outside the home, maybe, but like maybe. this house was not only huge, it was like a maze, like the way it's set up. I'm going to post pictures of like the layout of each floor. And it's crazy. Like if you aren't familiar with that house, you're not going to easily get all the way upstairs to a kid in her bedroom and then all the way downstairs to where she was found and then back up a flight to go to the kitchen and then back over this way. And then however the heck they got out, because all the window, all the doors were locked. So it's like, then they would have had to go back downstairs like, and without disturbing anyone. Right. And they said it was an older house that like creaked all the time. And a neighbor had, who lived across, there was an alley in the backyard, a neighbor who lived across there said she had dogs. And no matter time of day, if anyone walked through that alley, her dogs would go psycho and freak out. And her dogs never made a sound that night. So the odds are some, that somebody did not leave through the window that they think they left through. And I mean, we will get into that, but. Well, we will get into that after we take a break. So go refill your drink, hit the toilet, and we'll be right back <laughs> with more about the tragic death of jean Benet Ramsey on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. All right. All right, welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. Of course, we are talking about Jean Benet Ramsey. All right, so we left off. We were talking about the 911 call, the ransom note. We, of course, are going to move on to um, the evidence involved and, of course, the, the autopsy report, which I know you, you've, you of course, gone through. Yeah, um, and just a, uh, a heads up to anyone else that wants to look this up online themselves. Uh, years after this happened, somebody leaked the autopsy photos online. I will personally not be posting them anywhere of because course. I'm going to tell you of all the cases I've done, which is <laughs> 21. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the first time that I've come across like actual photos of the body and it is very very graphic mm -hmm. and especially the fact that it's a small child i did not need to see those i did not mean to see those no. i was specifically trying to see crime scene photos and for right. some reason they're all roped in and you end up seeing it and it's it's horrifying and then you purposely stay up till like five in the morning because you're like i don't want to sleep because <laughs> i don't want to think about it oh, so the no. point is don't don't go looking don't. for it it's don't. uh it's unsettling yeah so and yeah some of this is a bit graphic but this is what happened, folks. And so that's what we're just, that's what we're here for is to just discuss yes. the basics. So it was found um, during the autopsy that Jean Bonnet had a skull fracture. Um, apparently the skin is so elastic that your skull can break and the skin is fine. So you can't tell until uh, the skin is removed, which right. is horrifying. Yeah. Um, but it was like an eight and a half inch long fracture 
in her skull. Oh and keep my in mind, God. he was six years old. So her skull was like her tiny. Whole head. Yeah, it was tiny. Um, so the path- uh, one of the pathologists said he believes that a flashlight, which was found uh, in the home on the kitchen counter, was most likely to be the murder weapon because it was one of those like really heavy duty flashlights. And if you like the head of the flashlight almost exactly lines up with the fracture in her skull. So it's possible there was a flashlight on their counter. The Ramses claimed it wasn't theirs, but then John's oldest son, uh, John Andrew was like, I gave them one as a gift, just like that. It was in the drawer in their kitchen. So nobody claims to know where it's from, but also it's been, pointed out that the Ramses did own one just like that. But why it was placed there specifically that night, we don't know. Right. Um, cause of death was officially listed as asphyxiation. Um, she was strangled with a device called a garrote, which was essentially someone had taken a paintbrush that they found in a room next door to where she was found, uh, broke it in half and wrapped a cord around that and then wrapped it around her wrists and her neck so that all you have to do is just keep twisting and turning it and it just pulls the the noose tighter essentially uh she had scrapes on her back and her shoulders and her legs um there were signs that she had been assaulted Mm -hmm. in some way uh there were remnants of pineapple in her stomach that hadn't been digested yet There was no pineapple at the Christmas dinner she was at. So then it's like, well, when did she eat the pineapple? Because when they came home, she was asleep and they put her to bed. And then next thing they know, they found her dead. So it's like, when did she eat the pineapple? Well, there was a bowl of pineapple on the table that had Patsy's and Burke's fingerprints on it. Mm. So it's the question of who, who had that in the middle of the night Patsy says she would never serve it like that because it was a like a cereal bowl with a huge tablespoon. And to which I say, you know who would serve it like that? A child. I know because mine <laughs> will reach into the drawer and whatever utensil they grab, well, that's just what they're going to have cereal with. And it's always the biggest spoon they can find that doesn't fit in their face. So it's like, I truly think that he got up in the middle of the night and had himself a snack, which a quick aside the snack was a bowl of pineapple with milk on it. That's a thing. That not sounds for me. awful to me. Not yeah, for me. I mean, I awful. guess you put fruit and yogurt, but yeah, it feels that just feels like a real stretch. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah. Um, so there was that suitcase that was found in the room um, right underneath a broken window. But again, John had admitted he broke the window months before, and they had just never got it fixed. So police were like, oh, but where the suitcase is, it looks like someone would step on the suitcase and go out the window to leave the house. Well, John's friend Fleet has already admitted he moved the suitcase when he went in the room because he saw the broken window, moved the, was like moving things out of the way to check for glass to see if it had happened that night. But there was no glass that he found in the house. There was a piece of glass outside, which I felt was interesting. Um, but inside the suitcase, there were fibers from what John Bonet was wearing when she died. So it makes you wonder, did something happen to her? And they called 911 and put her in that suitcase with the thought of it's hidden. So if police check the house, we'll be okay. And then when the police leave to go find her, we can quickly do something with the body. And then when they realized the police weren't leaving in the hour and a half he had alone, John had to quickly come up with something else. Wow. I mean, that's a really aggressive theory, but I quickly stand by it. (laughs) Well, I mean, I mean, there's a, how else would that get in that suitcase? Yeah. I mean, she also had marks on her, like two little sets of abrasions that a particular investigator was like, well, that's clearly a stun gun. Oh, right. I remember that. But And then they were like, well, he obviously woke her up in the night, stun gunned her. And it's like, but anybody who's going to be stun gunned is going to scream. And nobody heard anything. 
So it's like, so I don't think so, but also measuring it against a stun gun and it's too big. So those marks were probably not from the stun gun. I can also attest as someone who owns a stun gun. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) Uh, They are, and listen, I can only assume that the technology has advanced. And I can tell you that the ones that are made now are exceptionally loud. They are deafeningly loud. So I think if that was happening in the still of night, you would hear it. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, very loud. I mean, I'll, even, I'll, I'll get one. <laughs> I'll get it from the bedroom. I'll do it on the last call tonight. I'll, I'll play you the sound. It's fucking loud. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I should have told you in advance because then you could have brought props and your box of wigs. <laughs> Oh well, again, we, we aren't making fun. What I We're bring just to the ta- uncomfortable. Yep. Yeah. Very uncomfortable. Yep, yep, exactly. And what I bring to the table is so random sometimes. Anyway. I like it. You bring what no one else can. Bless it. Yeah. Um, but yes. Uh, so yeah, uh, people were like, one investigator in particular was like, it's a stun gun. And he wouldn't let it go, even though like doctors were like, that is not a stun gun. And he was like, no, no, it was a stun gun. He wouldn't let it go. Um, years later, they did something called touch DNA on her pants. They found DNA on that that belonged to an unknown male. They found DNA under her fingernails that belonged to an unknown male. But then it was like, they were like, well, we don't know how accurate some of that can be because the testing might not have been great. And also she was, I mean, instead of the police being able to like look at the body where they found it, She was brought upstairs and then covered with another blanket, moved by two separate people. By the time they're going to get stuff on there that shouldn't have been. Um, But she had tape on her mouth uh, when she was found. but And the tape was so tight across her mouth that there was the impression of a perfect set of her lips on the inside of the tape. Mm. The thing of that is, the police were like, but at first they were like, well, obviously they put the tape on her mouth so that she couldn't scream. But it's like, but if she was alive when they put the tape on her mouth, she would have moved her mouth. Yeah, It would be smeared. It wouldn't be an exact imprint of her mouth. So that feels to me like it was clearly done after. Um, it showed there were signs and fibers that showed like maybe someone had wiped down her thighs And I wonder if someone did that maybe to cover up somebody else's DNA that might potentially be there. That's a thought. Sure. Um, Possible. Possible. Again, John had admitted to breaking the window after locking himself out. The fact that they didn't get that fixed in several months is shocking to me. But uh, the windowsill in that window, but still, so like investigators were like, well, obviously that's the entry and exit point for this perpetrator. Well, The windowsill had dust on it that wasn't disturbed and there was a spider web, cobweb in the corner of the window and an investigator went through the window to show that it's possible. But when he went through the window, he covered the entire window because it was a very narrow window. So if you go through it, you're going to brush out and take out that cobweb, but the cobweb was still there. So it feels like nobody went through that window. But again, I mean... I guess anything is possible. Um, many of the hairs and fibers collected from the blanket that were that was found uh, wrapped on the body were consistent with John Bonnet and Patsy. Fibers from Patsy's jacket that she had worn to the Christmas dinner night the night before were found on the paint tray. Um, they were also found on the ligature on her neck. And they were found on the blanket that she was found in and on the inside of the tape that was on her mouth. Now, I would like to point out that, yes, John moved the tape and then left it down in the wine cellar. But then Fleet got the tape and brought it upstairs. But at no point was it ever in the same room as Patsy. Right. But it had pieces of or fibers from her outfit. The other thing I'm jumping ahead in my notes because I just feel like it's organic. It happens. Yeah. The outfit that Patsy Ramsey was wearing that night 
to the, uh, the, on Christmas night when they go to their friend's house was the exact same outfit she was wearing when the police arrived the next morning. So some may say, sure, who hasn't gotten undressed at night, gone to bed, woken up, put on the same outfit? Sure. If you leave it on the floor there, sure. Um, friends have said there is no way Patsy would ever be seen in the same outfit two days in a row. And then you're like, maybe she just grabbed clothes on quickly and was like, I'm going to go get the kids up because they had that flight early, right? And she was just going to, once the kids are up, she'll go shower and change whatever. She got up, she did her hair and her makeup and put that outfit back on. Like she made a specific choice to put that outfit back on. To which then I say, or did she just not go to bed? Was she up all night? That's possible. Yeah, because I mean, I haven't seen the outfit, but I I feel like something you wear to like a a fancy ish, at least a friend level uh, Christmas dinner is probably not what you wear on an early morning flight the next morning, or that would be my perception. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but um, that's very interesting. That suggests yeah. to me somebody who has not been to bed. Correct. But, yeah. She her one of her police interviews. She outright said like, I got up. I did my hair and makeup. I got dressed. And it's like, so you just then rewore that outfit? Like, again, no shade. I would do it. But someone like her, this beauty queen that has a closets and drawers full of clean clothes and is going to go take a trip and then see, like, have a family Christmas at their vacation home, she's going to wear the outfit she wore for like several hours the day before. Yeah, that, that feels seems, unlikely. Especially when you go and have a big dinner and then like the scent of all of the foods get into your clothes. Like she yeah. it was some sort of like sweater and velvet pants. That's going to absorb some scent. You're not going to want to wear that the next day. You don't want to oh. wear velvet pants on a flight. That's all <laughs> that I can attest to. There we go. See? Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, there's things like that. There was also um, a baseball bat that was found at the house, Pat and John, Patsy, I love that she was suddenly my friend, Pat. Patsy <laughs> and John um, immediately were like, oh, that's not ours. We don't have a baseball bat. They asked Burke about it. And Burke was like, yeah, that's mine. That's ours. Um, they found a carpet fiber from the basement on Burke's baseball bat that I believe was found outside. So that's also interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, they found one fingerprint on the ransom note, and that would be one of the police analysts who was handed the note. Oh. So my question is, why wasn't even, why weren't Patsy and John's fingerprints on it when they found it and they read it? Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, the notepad had two police officers fingerprints on it because she handed it to them and five fingerprints from Patsy. So she's the only person but who handled that pad of paper according to all fingerprints found. Right. There were there were no fingerprints found on the garrote. Uh pineapple bowl had a set of prints from Burke and a set of prints from Patsy. Um the wine cellar door had two palm prints from Patsy and one palm print from Melinda, which I felt was interesting. Melinda was not even anywhere in the state huh. at the time. So I found that interesting. Um, also in the wine cellar where they found the body, they found a footprint to a high tech boot. Um, they were like, well, none of us own a high tech boot. Well, when they asked Burke, he's like, yeah, he owned a set of boots and if he was walking around in his own basement in those boots, well, it's his house. Why couldn't he? So wait, Burke was saying that Burke own, has high tech boots. Uh, he says he does. I don't know. They said that there were no boots like that found in the house, but it also easily could have been possibly a policeman's boot or something. But I find it interesting that if, someone is wandering around that house in boots. Like Jean Bonnet's carpet was white. Yeah. If they're tracking through things, leaving footprints, they're going to leave prints and dust and 
shit from those boots all throughout the house. Yeah. But they only found one in that cellar. So I also find that interesting. Yeah. Um, so months into the case, the district attorney decides to bring in a, an investigator named Lou Smith. Now, this guy was retired at the time, but he was so well-known and beloved and so had such a high, high success rate for closing cases that they were like, this is who we need. We're going to bring him in. So he interviewed the family and was like, you know what? I believe them. This was an intruder. He went on cameras, went outside their house and showed how somebody could like climb through that window in their basement and easily get in and get out. But again, he's not a large man, but he filled that window. So he right. would have taken out everything in that window, including that cobweb. He was also the one who truly believed that it was a stun gun, even though it was proven it was not, but he would not let it go. He was like, this is what it is, whatever. He believed that $118,000 at the time, the exchange rate would have been about 1 million pesos. Yeah. So he believed that whoever did this was a young white male. Um, they where they were like, they're going to take this money and they're going to go to Mexico. Um, he felt the Ramses were being targeted unfairly. He ended up resigning from the case because he couldn't stand how the police were treating the Ramses. He resigned from the case, but then continued to work it on his own until his death. He then asked, like his dying wish was like his daughter and his family take over the case and keep looking at it and all of this. Cause he kept very detailed notes and had, photos and all of these things. Right. Um, the thing that gets me, I understand, believe it, like he fully believed the Ramses, but John Ramsey himself spoke at this man's funeral. <laughs> to me, it's like, maybe you're too friendly with the subject matter to see That's what's in front of your own face. But again, he's closed more cases than I have. Sure. Fair uh, enough. <laughs> however, now, he seemed like a decent cop. He had this theory in his mind and he went after it. Now, there were some other police things that weren't positive, And it's just a section I'm going to call police fuck ups. <laughs> because <laughs> now, first thing, that contaminated crime scene. Yeah. They, they had family friends come over. People were walking around the house. Patsy and her friends, because they were waiting for what they thought was a phone call from kidnappers. Patsy and her friends are in the kitchen, wiping down counters, cleaning surfaces, doing dishes, tidying, doing all of this because they're just trying to do busy work to keep themselves you know, not thinking about what was going on. And that was acceptable. There was barely uh, any police around. There was only one detective at one point. Um, so when John Ramsey just took off, there was nobody who could go follow him because how could she keep track of two people in two different rooms at the same time? Because she was trying to also keep an eye on Patsy and see what was going on. Um, so they had so many people just in and out of that house and then John picking up the body and bringing it upstairs contaminated the crime scene and all of the evidence on the body. Um, the body getting covered in a different blanket contaminated the body. Um, at, the police in this case didn't, they were like, well, it's a kidnapping. We don't need to shut down the crime scene. And it's like, well, you, you do. Um, they also should have taken the couple and immediately separated them to interview them so they don't have time to corroborate their stories. Right. Um, but they outright refused to ever be interviewed separately, which I think we've touched on this in other episodes, but I didn't know people could say no to the police. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how those things work either. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're at 7.33, there was a canine unit with a tracking dog put on standby in case they needed to go find this girl, but they never used it. But if they had, imagine at 733, they bring that dog into that house, that dog would have found her. Yeah. And they would have found the crime scene as is. Right. But also, again, it's the day after Christmas. So there's less police that are working. Most are on holidays. So they're just like the cop who was there by herself tried multiple times to call 911 to get backup when the body showed up because she was like, 
I need assistance here. And there's just nobody that was coming because they didn't have the officers for it. So there are multiple things um, that were going wrong. Also during the investigation, the Ramsey's uh, lawyers were allowed to examine the actual ransom note. Um, they received an exact copy of it to look over it themselves. They were given the practice note uh, where it was Mr. and Mrs. with the, the line on it. Um, they were given all photographic negatives of the evidence photos. They were able to handle the garrote themselves. Like also, I why would you even want to? I guess maybe just the defense team, not specifically the uh, parents. But, right. um, and also the police were like, well, we want to talk to you separately. They're like, fuck that. We're not doing that. Yeah. If you talk to us, you're talking to us together. And they were like, well, we don't want to do that. So, um, so she dies on December 26th. On January 1st, John and Patsy decided, you know what? We're going to go on CNN and be interviewed publicly. That's going to be our first time talking to anybody about the case. And the first thing they said was, well, we didn't do it. And they specifically said the quote that they were a, that they were a nice and gentle family. That's weird. The, the term gentle, it was like, we could never have done this violent thing, essentially, is what they're saying. So it just felt like they were trying to put the blame away from themselves. But really, they just further pushed it on themselves. Because after yeah. that interview, people were like, oh, this is not right. Yeah, anytime somebody starts yelling out of nowhere, like, hey, I didn't do this crime. It's like, then people are going to start looking and going like, wow, maybe that person did that crime. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so the district attorney, Alex Hunter, had brought in this Lou Smith guy who lasted so long and then was like, I can't stand this. I'm out. Right. So police started asking him about getting a grand jury uh, together about this case. And his quote was, oh, this is a political decision. No, it's not. Um, I'm going to say it now. I was going to say it maybe later, but I feel very passionately about this. I truly believe, and there's nothing that will change my mind on this, um, that if John and Patsy Ramsey were not a white, very wealthy couple, they would have been arrested immediately. I truly believe that. I truly believe yeah. they would have gone through court and all of that. But because of that, because they're wealthy and they're white, I truly believe that's why it was suddenly a political decision as to whether there's going to be a grand jury brought in. Right. So after getting pressure from the public in September of 98, this DA is like, fine, we're going to do a grand jury. So their focus was on the ransom note and the possibility of could there have been an actual intruder or was it one of the people who were in the house? So they get this grand jury investigation going. There were 30,000 exhibits of evidence. It lasted for 13 months. Um, they disbanded in 99 and after seeing the aftermath of the OJ trial, this district attorney didn't want to waste taxpayers' money if he wasn't guaranteed a conviction. So after getting all the grand jury information, he goes, you know what? Not enough evidence. My people didn't find enough. Sorry, no. And then 14 years go by, and suddenly it turns out they actually did want to um, put the crime on John and Patsy. They couldn't decide which one of them did it based on the evidence, but they knew somebody was guilty. So they were, they were like, yeah, we want to charge them both. And the district attorney looked at it and chose not to indict them. No. So he made the choice. And then in 2013 documents got released. And that's how we found out that the grand jury in fact was like, yeah, they did it. We think they did it. We want to indict them. And the district attorney was like, no, they couldn't have done it. Well, and wasn't, wasn't the district attorney the one who had originally appointed Lou Smith? It sure was. Yeah. And Lou Smith being the one who was completely convinced that it was an unknown intruder, not at all the Ramseys. Yes. John Ramsey went on to speak at Lou Smith's funeral. It sounds to me like perhaps this is not a coincidence. Correct. Yeah. Um, now... I know it seems like it's early, but we still got a ways to go. So 
nobody, yeah. nobody be afraid. We're going to get into suspects. Yeah. Well, there's just there's so many. A lot. Yeah. Um, the first one I'm going to mention quickly, it's not so much a suspect as a theory. The theory is that John Bonet is not actually dead. Right. In 2014, there became some rumor that John Bonet did not die. They faked her death and she is actually Katy Perry. Right. To which I say, she's not. <laughs> she's just not. <laughs> yeah. um, there is a like a six year age difference. And in the late 90s, Katy Perry was making like a name for herself in high school, getting like a band. And there's no way Jean Bonnet would have been a band age, like would have been high school age at that point. So like it yeah, just, the math doesn't work out. The math out doesn't and, work, yeah. And I get that they have very similar faces. They're both, I'm sure, I've never seen pictures of Katy Perry when she was a child, but I'm sure both adorable children. Yes. The point is, she's not Katy Perry. Yeah. Uh, so the we for suspects, we've got, could it have been just an unknown intruder Um, investigators found that there were 38 registered sex offenders within 1.8 miles of their house. Good God. Yeah. Um, But again, the family who lived across the alley uh, have two dogs that bark whenever they hear someone in that alley. And if someone was going to exit out of that window, they would have gone through the backyard to that alley and the dogs never heard a thing. Is it possible the dog slept through it? Sure. I'll give them all. Sure. Um, the But again, like the windowsill, all the dust on it wasn't disturbed. Again, though, sure. I'll give you the maybe. Okay. Uh, so we have, so it could be somebody we don't know of. It could also be somebody, uh, there's a guy named Bill McReynolds. The heartbreaking thing is his nickname is Santa Bill. Oh, God. So he's an older gentleman with a very large white beard. Um, Him and his wife were actually at the Ramsey home two nights before for a Christmas party because this guy plays Santa at their Christmas parties. Um, The other thing that the police felt was very interesting is that exactly 22 years to the day from when Jean Bonnet was found, this guy's uh daughter and her friend were abducted molested and then released after a few hours and that case is unsolved to this day wow but it was the fact that it happened on december 26 1974 was a very like it was exactly to the day that had police like okay that's weird yeah. and jean, jean benet loved this guy because it was santa for crying out loud and she was six years old and it's, they said that when he came into the house, she took him on a tour of the whole house. But again, he's an, like a 60 some year old man. I don't believe he could have gotten in and out of a window. I don't believe he's even going to remember two days later. Cause that house again was a maze of like, you have to go through one room to get to an, like, it was just weird. I don't feel like he could have done it, but um, in 1977, his wife, Janet wrote a play about the torture and murder of a 16-year-old girl who was found dead in a basement. Oh, my God. So then police are like, these people aren't right. Um, But they both gave hair, saliva, and handwriting samples and also had a solid alibi. So they ended up being excluded because nothing matched. Right. But again, he was 67 years old. And four months before this, he had had heart and lung surgery. So I don't know if he was really up for climbing in and out of windows yeah, and going through all of that. I mean, sure, he'd probably willingly sit and write a three-page letter, but again, <laughs> I don't think that was him. Yeah. So then we've also got Gary Oliva. So December of 2000, the police get a call from the University of Colorado police They arrested a 38-year-old drifter who had trespassed on their property. He was wearing a backpack. Inside the backpack, there was a photo of Jean Bonnet, a poem he wrote about her, and a stun gun. Again, they were really narrowing in on this stun gun. Right. And then the guy admits 
he actually has a large shrine to her in his home. Oh, Jesus. He was also convicted of uh, a sex offense against children in Oregon. And he had gone to prison because he attempted to strangle his own mother with a phone cord. So also, there was a candlelight vigil for Jean Bonnet a year to the day after she died. And when they went through that footage, he was there. Oh, And it's a very well-known, like, real sickos will want to visit it and watch this kind of thing. Right. Um, he has, he fully admitted to having an obsession with her. He printed photos from the internet of her. He put, he cut out her face and put it on monopoly money, which I don't really understand, but okay. Um, his saliva and handwriting samples were not a match. So he was excluded. But then we've got a guy named Michael Helgoth. Now, in February of 97, like two months after her murder, uh, the DA has a press conference that was like a really serious, like, we're committed to this. We have a long list of suspects, but every day we're taking the suspects off. And at the end, and he he really like looks into the camera and is like, and at the end, the only name left is going to be yours we're coming for you, like a really serious threat. Wow. The day after this press conference, a guy named Michael Hel- Helgoth commits suicide. Oh. He's found in his home alone. He, in the room with him, is a pair of high-tech boots and a stun gun. Um, also, I'd be careful Googling his name because they also have the photo of when they found him. Oh, God. But the, ch- the child photos are worse. So yeah, if you yeah. see that first, yeah, there you go. Oh God. Uh, I don't recommend it. No. Um, so this, this guy, Michael, his friend, John is like, Oh, I fully believe he did this because at one point he says that Helgoth told him he wanted to know what it feels like to crack a human skull. Uh, he had a flashlight that went missing. It was his most prized possession. He had suspicious behavior leading up to it. He uh, worked near the Ramsey home at the time. He had a history of violence and sex sex abuse. He had told somebody in November that him and a partner were going to come in to like $50,000 to $60,000 a piece. It was this killer deal. And then after Christmas, someone asked him about that killer deal. And he was like, oh, it went by the wayside. So it's like, okay, maybe. Um, the, the curious thing though, I mean, again, you don't want to see the photos, but the stun gun and the boots look very placed to me. Mm -hmm. Um, but also he was right-handed, but the shot came from a left angle and it, there was evidence left that he used a pillow as a silencer, even though he lived alone. Mm Mm-hmm. And also the boots didn't match the footprint. So there's that. I think really that this guy was just his own thing. Like, I don't know if somebody found him and was like, he, he's a good Patsy. Let's use him. Right. The cops barely touched on him before they were like, oh yeah, that's not our guy. Right. Again, I'd be interested in seeing just a DNA. Yeah. Show me some files. (laughs) <laughs> let me in the police computer like Give ten, her 10 minutes you won't even know i'm there she's she'll leave it like she found it i'll clean up after myself like a campsite <laughs> oh god i hope it's more fun than camping <laughs> oh, anything <laughs> is yeah oh hello yeah, yeah uh so i guess sure i mean michael Helgoth. could be couldn't be sure. i don't know again we're just here to talk about pe- potential people it could be Absolutely. We are not saying that any of these people outright did it. Not publicly recorded, we're not. Nope. And so no one has a reason to sue us over anything. Nope. I'm letting that stand. Yep. So there's a guy named Michael Tracy. He's a journalism professor at the University of Colorado. He became a Jean Bonnet case expert. Like he kind of was just really in it. He became friendly with the Ramses. 
he's, it became well known he was involved in this case in some respect. And so he started getting emails from a person that called themselves Daxis, and they claimed that they were involved in Jean Bidet's murder. So Daxis admits that they have an obsession with Jean Bonnet, admits to being a pedophile, quote, my favorite age is six, Ugh. which is among the most disgusting things I've ever heard. Yeah. Um, then this Daxis just outright claims that he killed Jean Bonnet. Uh, he knew about the bracelet that she was wearing when she was found. He knew that the underwear she was wearing when she was found said Wednesday on it. Like he knew things. He knew that she had a runny nose. Now that seems like a weird thing, but under the tape and like on the inside of the tape um, that was found over her mouth, they knew that she had had a runny nose, but somehow this person knew about it. So this guy contacts police and is like, I, this guy seems like he knows a little too much. Right. And so the police kind of want to trap this guy and find him. And the guy's only request is he wants to talk to Patsy himself. Well, at the time, Patsy was battling breast cancer, or I think it was ovarian cancer at the time. Sorry. She's battling cancer, but I think she agreed to it. They give her a number that he can contact Patsy at. They end up tracing him. He's in Bangkok, Thailand. So police go to Bangkok and find Daxis, who is really a 41-year-old from Alabama named John Mark Carr. He was married twice, the first time to a 13-year-old girl. Stop. He was a school teacher. Ah, in 2001, he was arrested and charged for child pornography, five counts of possession oh my God. while being a school teacher. So uh, to get away from it, he fled to Thailand. I bet he did. Yeah. So warrant gets put out for his arrest. August 2006, he's arrested, extradited to the U.S. There is a huge media storm of this guy. It's like, look. It's the guy. He's confessed. We finally got it. It's yeah. been 10 years. We're good to go. His DNA did not match. He quickly flees the country again. What? He gets interviewed in 2016. So another 10 years <laughs> later and says, I was with her when she died. No one killed her. She died accidentally. Where she was found is not where she died. And because he said he couldn't help himself with his urges. He had a procedure done and had himself castrated. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but he claims he was not the one who killed her, but that he was in fact there. However, uh, one of his ex-wives was like, no, he was with me at the time when she died in Alabama. Oh my God. I have so many questions. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, how would he have that information then? That's a great question. I'm thinking like by the time he knew he heard about it, it was 2006. I mean, I think by then maybe the uh, autopsy photos were already online. Mm. 2006, it does feel. Yeah, I mean, Facebook existed by then, right? Yeah. Cause like somebody I'm just using have... that as a benchmark of like, where were oh, we yeah, in yeah. the internet? You know what I mean? Yeah. We were absolutely my space. Yeah. I think I joined Facebook around Oh seven. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So it feels possible that he could have gotten that information on the internet. Oh yeah. Okay. Because like, again, the, the photos are so graphic and you can yeah. see the bracelet she's wearing Ugh. when they show the shot of like, all of the pieces of clothing and stuff, there is a picture of the underwear. And I'm sure if he looked close enough and who knows, maybe, maybe it was like, maybe there's, and I say maybe, but I know there probably is some sort of like really dirty, dark web, like disgusting pedo Ugh. forum where they talk and they share things like this. And all oh, it takes yeah. is somebody to say that. And suddenly everybody knows about it. Well, she was such a publicly known figure. Yeah. 
You're right. And because you're right. This person, there. this person has a history of being arrested for child pornography. You're right. So yeah. I'm sure we don't even need to get into that. Um, so, but, but he had been basically like extradited because of this. And then I guess yeah. he was exonerated because the DNA didn't match. And so then yes. he fled and that's why he could do an interview 10 years later. And yes, nobody cares. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well. I mean, he was charged with child abuse uh, multiple times, but the first time being marrying a 13 year old girl, he essentially kidnapped her, took her across state and married her. Good Lord. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he cut yeah. his, uh, balls yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. Good. I mean, I hope that he actually did that and that that wasn't him just like trying to sound like a martyr or something. I hope that he actually yeah. did. His, it's really, I don't recommend watching anything that has his interviews in it because he's, he's terrifying. Like there is a level of creep that it's just, it's just, it's like he's seeing inside your soul and you're like, I'm good. I'm good. I don't want to, nope, nope. He's yeah. just, it's, it's not right. It's not right for a human being to be like that. And yeah. he's not a human being. He's a pile of trash. And there I've said it. Well, yeah. Some would also argue uh, if you believe in energies, like I do, a, a demon that there's, there's something, there's a darkness in there. Oh, there is something like his yeah. eyes are dead mm. and it's just, there's something not right. Um, <sighs> but don't worry. We got more creeps. God, I know. Um, so in 1993, police get a call that a resident from Thornton, Colorado, which is very close to Boulder, where it happened, um, had killed a four-year-old girl named Lacey Ruff in Hawaii. Oh. Um, a guy named Todd Shanlu called the police and said that his brother Aaron kidnapped, assaulted, and killed this little girl. So Todd, so then Aaron goes to jail Todd goes back to the the mainland in the U.S., uh, moves in with a woman and her daughter named Kaylee in 2010. And Kaylee says, this dude has a dark vibe. She didn't, she felt he was so uncomfortable. And she said he got drinking one night and he admitted to doing something terrible in Hawaii and said he was the one that actually put this little girl in the ocean. Oh my God. Um, so he had been doing construction in Colorado in like the 96 ish time frame. Um, Todd had admitted that he knew someone that was connected to the Jean Bonnet case, but never said who, um, there was also an incident in the eighties where a little girl was taken from, uh, on her way to school and she was assaulted. Um, and I, I believe she was also killed and Aaron, the brother, was blamed for this, but it has later come out that it was actually Todd oh. who did all of this. But as far as I know, his DNA was not a match, but they're going to retest it. And mm -hmm. that's where it was left. I'm not so sure it's him. Um, I get that he has attacked multiple children. They were between the ages of six and eight or four and eight, I believe. Right. Um, and all were asphyxiated. So it's like, yes, it's all very similar. So it's, I won't rule him out until we yeah. have official proof that rules him out. But the main suspects where there is the most information on are the Ramsey family themselves. Yeah. Now, within minutes of finding the body, Police overhear John on the phone to his private pilot trying to arrange for a flight for his family to go to Atlanta. What? They were originally from Georgia and they, he was like, oh, that's our home. That's our safe space. So he was just trying immediately. That was his first instinct was my child is dead. I'm going to get out of state. That's weird. Yep. It keeps going. Oh, um, again, he disappeared for an hour and a half. No one knows where he was. And the detective said when he reappeared, he was suddenly no longer the calm man he was before. He was extremely agitated. So what went down in that hour and a half? I have a lot of questions about that. Yeah. 
Um, again, police say they're going to go through the house top to bottom. John immediately grabs his friend and takes him right beeline to where the body is. Mm -hmm. Um, again, he puts her on the ground and not like on the couch or anything thinking like, I'm going to rest her someplace comfortable kind of thing. Um, John's own friend Fleet and his wife wrote a 14 page open letter to the Colorado district attorney, um, saying that, uh, the Ramseys aren't cooperating. You guys need to look into them further. Why aren't you looking into them further? We need this solved. Do this for Jean Benet. Because they're like, we've, knew, we've known them for a few years and we love that little girl like she's our own. Get this solved. They're hiding something. Wow. And to be fair, their friends, like the Ramseys immediately were like, oh, there's something not right with them. They're, they're, they, uh, they, treat, they were treating us really weird and you know, they were jealous. She, the wife was jealous of Patsy. So they probably did this. So yeah, I, after hearing that, I would be like, yeah, I'll write an open letter to let everybody know that you're not right. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Ramses on January 1st, like not even a week after their daughter dies, they go on CNN before they speak with police and say, we are a loving and gentle family. Which again, is not, is a, it's specifically to say gentle when something so violent has happened to your child. It's just yeah. the wording of it to make it seem like it's, see, we would never, we could never do it. Um, just forgive me, my notes are going to be all over the place, but we're kind of in a manic state, so this is where it is. There was one thing I just wanted to say very quickly, and yeah. you shuffle around and figure out what you, you need to, and it, take this respite if you need it. I will just say, and I know that, and I preface this by saying I've never gone through it, and I, I get it, that I can never speculate because I've never gone through it. But you're looking for your child. You find your child in this your, your very young child in this very horrific state. I feel like the instinct, and you tell me what you think, but I feel like the instinct is, sure, to get that tape off of the mouth, but then to, like, do CPR. Like, isn't the instinct to your gut wanting to be that the child is alive? Like, wouldn't you, even if that's irrational as opposed to taking it off and then picking her up and moving her. Like, I don't know, like, like to me, and again, I know we can't judge because who knows what we would all do in that situation. It's insane. And I get it, but yeah. I am just saying that it does strike me a little odd that the, that the first instinct wasn't to try and do something life resuscitating. I feel like a, yeah. most people in that moment would be like, Oh my God, I have to try and assume that this child is still alive. My child is still alive as opposed to like, I'm going to pick her up and move her. I don't know. It, that That's just very strange to me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I try not to think about it, but I know, honestly, I, I, I think, think again, who knows what it's like in the moment. Of course. But I truly think like if in a similar situation, I think it would be like, yes, I understand the remove the tape. I understand the trying to get the things off, but I would also be f just frozen on the spot, fucking screaming. Yeah. Like I would be screaming like, for somebody to come help me. And like, it's a horror show. You've walked in on yes. a, like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to belabor this point because it's so bad, but you know what I mean? It's just odd to me. That's an yeah. odd, an odd chain of events to me. I yes. think that's a very strange. And again, I get it. We can't speculate because it's, uh, it's an extreme situation, but. I just wanted to make a note of that because it feels strange. Yes, I fully agree. Yeah. Um, also, that same interview that they did on um, CNN, somebody asked Patsy, or they asked technically both John and Patsy. They were like, so you believe an intruder broke into your home and they kind of keep rattling off with the question and Patsy sitting there shaking her head. No. And then John goes, yes. And suddenly she starts shaking her head. Yes. Physical cues like that are something that like you do without even thinking about it. Yeah. Which is why when someone says no, but they're really shaking their head. Yes. It's like, well, you're trying to lie, but your body is like, I already know the truth. It's kind of how it goes. 
Yeah. Also, they hired a media consultant in the first week that their daughter had died um, and immediately got themselves on CNN. I mean, I really don't believe that my instinct would ever be, I need to get a media consultant. My instinct would be, I want to talk to the police and get this solved. I need to find who did this kind of, like, I feel like that would be where my instinct goes. Um, But the John and Patsy weren't the only ones who had really weird interviews. We're going to go to their son, Burke. Now I get it. He's very, a uh, very introverted child. And again, he is a child. He's nine years old. Um, so not kids are weirdos. I know sure. I have a nine-year-old. He is a, I love him to death, but super weird. Uh, so yeah, I get the kids are going to be weird. But like a couple weeks after Jean Bonnet dies, Burke gets interviewed by social services. He gets asked if he has any secrets because asking a child, like usually someone in like a predatory situation will use like the, it's our little secret as like something that they should not tell somebody. So it's like a key thing to be like, get them talking about secrets in the hope that they will reveal something that's happened to them or whatever to let them know what's going on. So she asks, do you have any secrets? And he goes, oh, I probably do, but I don't really remember them. And if I did, I don't think I'd tell you, which feels insane. Um, And they ask him how things are going after his sister has died. And he goes, I'm basically just going on with my life. That's... That's something for, that's, that's, that's putting up. Okay. There's a flag that's being put up for me. Yeah. That's a very interesting statement for a nine-year-old to say anyway. Like it's in a very adult concept. Mm -hmm. And I understand that that's something that a child could mimic that they may have heard that, that phrase. Yeah. You know, you just have to, you know, blah, 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 and go and just go on with your life or just get on with your life. Like I know that it's a turn of phrase. But that's a very, I mean, you're, you're a child and your younger sibling has been, been killed. Mm-hmm. That, that feels, I mean, again, I'm not a child psychologist. I don't pretend to be. I can't diagnose anything. I don't know. But again, that feels off. <laughs> yeah. I think that's probably safe to say. Uh, yeah, I can't find it here, but there was also a part in the interview where they asked him something and, uh, his answer was, oh, I don't recall. Which is again, not something a nine-year-old would say naturally. They maybe would say, oh yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But I don't recall sounds like the most coached phrase. Like, uh, if they ask you anything about her, just say, I don't recall. Yeah. You know, Um, they also asked him, what do you think happened? To which he said, oh, I know what happened. And then said, I asked my dad where they find where they found her body. And they're like, "Okay, but like, what do you think happened? And he said, I think that someone took her very quietly, tiptoed down to the basement and then maybe like took a knife out. Or maybe a hammer and then like hit her in the head maybe. And like he mimics doing the action of like, and then just maybe like a hammer or like a knife. And the way he mimics that arm movement is like, well, they think someone using that arm movement with that level of force is what caused her skull fracture. But to say like, oh, I know what happened. And the to me, it's so disturbing to hear I think they took her really quietly and like tiptoed down the basement. It's like, uh uh-huh. Do you do that with her often? Like I just, again, I know that he's a child, but these are still out of the mouths of babes. Yeah. You know, like kids are going to have like an honest, no filter that they just can't help it because they don't know any better. Yeah. I do remember too. I did a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, Googling it during my busy week because I remembered something from a documentary that I watched years ago. Um, and wasn't there something in one of the interviews where they asked him if he felt safe in the house? Yeah. 
And he said, yes. Yep. That's weird. Yeah. If we are to believe that the family believes that an intruder came in and took his sleeping sister out of bed, took her into the basement and murdered her. Yeah. One would think that it, the surviving child would be terrified to sleep in that house. Yep. Like, I, I think that, again, not child psychologists, I think that's like 99% of children. Wouldn't you think? Um, <laughs> I, like, absolutely. I think that that's a very, that's a huge, huge alarm bell that's going off for me. Yeah. I mean, I just, they also ask the family, they ask John and Patsy, like, do you think you're, do you live, do you think your neighborhood is safe? And they were like, oh yeah. It's like, but you believe somebody broke into your house and did horrific things to your child. And you're just like, oh yeah, our neighborhood's great. Why wouldn't the answer be, well, up until now we did. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's, it's just weird to me. I mean, they also ask Burke, how are you dealing with it now? And he goes, I don't know. I kind of forget about it because sometimes I'm just, you know, playing video games. So like two weeks into the death of his sister and he's like, I just kind of forget about it. It does feel like there's a the, the distinct lack of emotion Certainly. Yes. And I know that, you know, again, kids can be weird and maybe he was being, you know, a weird kid and putting up some sort of front, but it feels like, again, and I know there's, of course, there's like the famous moment in those interviews for people who've followed this case where he gets asked to draw a picture of the family and yeah. he, he draws the mom and the dad and him and he doesn't draw Jean Benet, yeah. which again, it's like, two weeks after this death, I think a lot of children would still include their deceased sibling because that's the, the life that they've always known. And again, not a child psychologist, but it felt very much like it's interesting to me that, or, or perhaps a child, again, I have no clue, but perhaps a child would, would draw the sibling as an angel or something. I don't know, but they would include them in some it, way. It feels like they would be included, like for, for her to just not be there. And then much like this answer, you just said that where it was like, I kind of forget. It's like, what? You would think it would be such a huge part of their lives at that point. Yeah. You know, like daily that they would still be talking about it and all of this, but he's somehow just doesn't think about it. I mean, in two years before he hit her in the face with a golf club. I've seen reports like a, a photographer who was taking, who took most of the pictures of Jean Benet um, said that she showed up once and Jean Benet had this scar under her eye and Patsy said, oh, the kids were playing around and Burke lost his temper. But yet later on, when Burke is asked about it, when he's an adult, it's like, oh, I was golfing in the yard and I, you know, raised the club behind me and she walked out behind me and got clipped in the face. So yeah, total accident. And it's like, well, then why did your mother say you lost your temper? So Great there's question. that. Yeah. I mean, also, it, you know, it, it, I think it goes without saying, and I don't think I'm say, saying, saying anything that anyone doesn't already know, but like, obviously the main focus of this family was Jean Benet. Like she was a be, essentially like a little celebrity. She was definitely yeah. the focus of Patsy's life. Um, yeah. I don't know how involved John was in the family. I mean, obviously he worked a lot. He was the, of course the breadwinner. We know that. Um, it feels perhaps like, is it plausible that Burke felt pushed aside because it seems that he was pushed aside? Yeah, that feels possible. Mm -hmm. The one thing I do want to add that I did bring to the table because, you know, Christy and I did send a, a couple of messages back and forth. And this one, I was like, did you find this? And she was like, no, um, yeah. was that one of the housekeepers that had worked for them. Now, listen, again, this is her testimony. So who knows? but did say that there was multiple occasions when Burke had allegedly smeared his feces on items of Jean Benet's. So this Christmas in question, the Christmas where she died, it was on, there was, there was apparently, I don't know whether it was still found there or if it was like a, a luminol type test, 
but they did find his feces on her, like a box of Christmas chocolate. Apparently they had also found it in her bed at one point. And apparently they'd also found it smeared on a bathroom wall at one point. Mm -hmm. So that sounds to me like, again, who knows? I haven't read any sort of (laughs) any textbooks, but that feels to me like expressing an emotion of, of sorts. Yeah. That's probably safe to say, right? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I can't even begin to imagine, but like, I, I'm disappointed because Burke did a, uh, interview with Dr. Phil as an adult a few yes. years ago yeah. and like the 20th anniversary, you know, just wanted to give his first interview, get it out there. I don't believe it was ever mentioned about the, uh, shitting on her stuff, but that's, that's, there's a level of anger and resentment there. Yeah, if I that's think. true, again, that there was a former housekeeper that did, I think, go on record saying it, but again, right, I don't know. I, I was trying to corroborate. But again, yeah, that interview was also very interesting. Yeah, I mean, he was, it, I'm sure he was nervous. He's He kind of always is just living on his own, kind of doing his own thing. And the place he works, he works from home, so he doesn't have to go to an office setting. And I can only imagine how alone he probably felt for most of after this happened because they're trying to keep him away from the press. And I'm sure he had to deal with like psychiatrist interviews for decades after something like that. So he was a little, I don't know if he ever got to like go and be a normal kid after this happened. So people are like, well, he's an introvert. He's very awkward, whatever. And his social skills leave something to be desired um because yeah he spends that entire interview like smiling there seems like no sadness no remorse not that he would have remorse because we don't know um but then dr phil outright is like what do you say to people who think you killed john bonnet and his answer was look at the evidence or lack thereof And to me, that's just such a weird way of being like, yeah, well, if you could have caught me by now. Well, the other thing I would just like to add is if somebody really has felt like their entire life has been ruined over something like this, Mm -hmm. uh, which I'm not denying that it hasn't been, um, why do the interview at all? Why not change your name? Why not move somewhere, change your name? Like, why put your face out there? with Dr. Phil and identify yourself as this person who, as we all know, I think if you're listening to this, you know, there is a lot of, you know, speculation about his involvement in Jean Benet's death. Obviously, Dr. Phil asked him outright about it. Obviously, also, there was a documentary that was done and and he sued them for defamation because they basically said, like, all the evidence points towards Burke. Yeah. And they settled out of court for a very large amount of money um, because, again, you know, that's how defamation works. But anyway, yeah. um, again, my, my question is just if somebody truly wanted to be left alone and, and wanted, you know, peace, why do that? Um, I get that that's rhetorical, but my guess, and again... I have nothing but the last week of my life to base this on. I'm going to go with money. Mm. Because after this went down, John Ramsey was pretty much unhirable. Oh. Nobody wanted her around. He spent so much money on like private investigators and lawyers and all of this. And like he ended up with like nothing. And sold the house and they moved and all of this. So I have a feeling that it's like, yeah, if Dr. Phil came to me and was like, I'll give you 50 to 100 grand to do this interview, I'd be like, yeah, if they already think I killed them, then this isn't going to help one way or the other. So, okay. The thing that I find gross that I learned about is at the time he was nine years old. And in the state of Colorado, you have to be 10 before you could be um, convicted of a crime of that nature. So if it came out now that he murdered her, 
he wouldn't be convicted of it because he was only nine years old at the time. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Cause there's, I mean, obviously certain crimes have that statue of limitations, right? Murder does not murder does not, no. but they would look at it as at the time he was under the age of 10. So there's like, wow. it, everything I read was very much like, there's nothing they could do anyway. Which so arguably, I, I would love to believe that like, if you do something, even at that age, if you finally confess to it or evidence is found that it could be like, oh, okay, finally, we can punish them now. Right. But the idea of just like, well, you can't punish me for something I did 20 some years ago because I, I was a child. It's so And dark. again, we're not saying that he did it. No, There's we are no aren't. evidence that says exactly he did it. There are multiple people it could be. We are speculating. You know, Don't sue us. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's a lot of things. I mean, like things I've said before, like fa close family friends have stated Patsy would never be caught dead wearing the same clothes two days in a row. But yet she was. So it's like, did she go to bed that night or did she really wake up and put that set of clothes on again? It feels odd to me. Um, they said... Where is it? Uh, that Jean Bonnet had visited the doctor's office 33 times over the previous three years. And that what? Patsy had called the office three times on the evening of December 17th. They never determined what the calls were about. However, they uh, the police had gathered affidavits stating in a very clear way, that there were injuries consistent with prior trauma and sexual abuse, mm. and that there was chronic abuse to her. She was, John Bonet was also going through like a serious bedwetting issue. Right. Um, which can at that age be a sign of some sort of abuse going on. Of course. Or there like high levels of anxiety, that kind of thing. So it's like, yeah. who knows what was happening? Who knows? who in her life could have been causing this, but it seems like something was going on 33 times in three years to a doctor seems crazy. And I'm now feeling like, am I an unfit mother? I don't think my children have seen a doctor <laughs> in like three years. So it's like, wait, does that make me a shitty parent or am no. I a good parent because of it? I can't tell. <laughs> the point is it's like 33 times is insane. Yeah, You're looking that's like, at like once a month, once a month. Yeah. Which feels a lot. And then there's also, so there was when they called the family friends, their like second call of like, we have to get somebody here. We have to have people here to support us. Um, there was also a, a priest brought in reverend, whatever we're going to say again, I'm not good with religion. Sure. Um, his name was father Halverstock when asked about his thoughts on the morning when he first got there, um, he said that when John brought John Bonnet upstairs um, and was like, it was the reveal that they had found her. Right. He said that John blurted out, I don't think he meant to kill her because she was wrapped in a blanket. What? then how, how do you know that the killer is a he? And also, like, where's that testimony? Like, wow. Again, the grand jury voted to indict them. And the district attorney was like, oh, no, we'd never get a conviction. And I truly believe if they'd gone to court over this, they wouldn't have got a conviction because they're white and they're wealthy. Yeah. And, well, yeah. you know, and she's a former Miss... America pageant person. And she's, you know, she's the sweet Southern lady who just loves her daughter so much. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you know, you never know with, um, also I'm going to forget. I can't find exactly where it was. So there, there is a neighbor of the Ramses named Mrs. Fernie. And she recalled at one point, John Ramsey asked her or asked her if someone could stop by their home and get his golf bag from the house. 
she said that uh, the person was like, I can't, the police will not let us downstairs. So I can't get your golf bag. But it's like, I, you, you were headed to, they at this point were already in Georgia about to like bury the child. And your first thought was, I need, where, what about my golf bag? I need to get my golf bag. It's not like he would have been golfing. So then the question is, was something put in the golf bag to hide to get it out of the house? Well, let me tell you, dear listeners, I don't know what was in the golf bag, but do you want to know where the golf bag was? About four feet from the wine cellar door. Come on. And there is evidence that she was potentially killed on the mat outside the wine cellar door. So, I mean, if something was put in there, I don't know how much they checked everything. Again, I want to see these files. Show yeah. me your files. Just give her the files. Give me the files. Also, somebody had recalled uh, Patsy asking if they could ret- retrieve the black pants that she'd worn on that morning. And when someone asked her about, like, why do you need those specific pants? She was like, oh, I just really like those ones. And it's like, mm, or you don't think that they should be around police, maybe. That's another thought. Wow. Yeah, like, I mean, it should also be noted that in 2008, the new district attorney, not the same one, but not a better one, did completely and publicly exonerate the Ramses from anything having to do with this case. Um. I'm still, I mean, I know how I feel, but I'm somewhat scared to say some of them out loud. Um, Like police went into their home to check over things again in July of 97. They had painted every room. They'd ripped up the carpet in Jean Bonnet's room and replaced it. Like, and now suddenly like the he, there was a huge photo. I think the photo before was of Jean Bonnet. It was now a picture of Patsy and Burke. So it just, there were little things yeah. that were very weird. Like um, Patsy had a habit when she would write notes to her friends of writing using acronyms. Um, for example, she signed one letter that they found. Um, it said... Uh, uh, to BVFMFA, which meant to Barbara V. Fernie, Master of Fine Arts. And it's like, that's a weird thing to put it in letters. It's almost like the person who signed the ransom note, SBTC, and they could never figure out what that was. <laughs> you know, isn't Jesus. that weird? Um, so it's little things like that, that are like, it's just off. It's off. You know, there's something off about it. And I mean, the only other things I'm going to say about this, uh, one, because it's kind of like a bizarre fact. And I did promise you a fun fact that's going to make you go, no kidding. You did. Um, Patsy did unfortunately pass away. Yes. In, I want to say 2009-ish? No, it had to be an earlier. I believe she passed away about 2004, 2005. In 2007, he's single, ready to mingle. So who does John Ramsey date but Natalie Holloway's mom? (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) Because, you know, why not? I guess they have a shared set of trauma similar trauma it seemed like absolutely his like that was his reasoning behind like when people were like that's weird and he's like it's not weird it's not weird it's weird john it's weird Um, i mean how do you even find each other at the like you know famous bereaved parents meetings like wow that's wild there's a lot of questions i mean that's I don't even know what to do with that. I also love that I said that I was done, but I'm not. There was also an interview where um, Patsy outright said, I would have nothing left if I lost Burke. 
So it's like, so somebody wants to make sure that nothing happens to Burke and Burke isn't taken away. And it's like, okay. Um, again, though, they were completely exonerated, but I yeah, just feel like there's one too many things that are unsettling, one too oh. many coincidences that just aren't right, because I feel like there is no way in hell somebody did that and wrote that letter. That letter's just not right. Yep. Um, um, well, listen, we've got to wrap this up because once yes. again, I think we've, we've again surpassed our longest episode ever, but it's what yep. we do now. It's what we do. So yeah. lay it on me. What are your final thoughts? I'll give you my final thoughts and we'll get the heck out. Um, first, I mean, obviously this is an incredible tragedy and we have yeah. just barely made it out of this episode. Yeah. Um, one of the things, so many things bother me about this. One thing that bothers me and is right up there and everyone's going to be like, why is that a thing that bothers you, Christy? It seems so benign. Um, Jean Bonnet was buried in a tiara and one of her pageant gowns. And I know that you're like, yeah, Christy, they want to remember her, whatever. To which I say, even in death, you can't even let that sweet little girl be a six-year-old. Yeah. Just let her be herself. She had to be the stage yeah. Jean Bonnet. She couldn't just be the Jean Bonnet she was. So I find that especially tragic on top of a tragedy. Um, but it just, reading that, it did not sit well with me. But I know they're exonerated. I know yeah. we don't have the proof, but I can't help but think that family is involved somehow. I don't yeah. think this was premeditated. No. I truly believe that something was going on and there was an accident and it got staged. And someone, even John, was like, what, you think I'm going to stage the scene? But then I turn around and unstage it because he took the tape off her mouth and he undid the things and whatever. And he's like, why would I do that if I was setting the scene? Why wouldn't I let you see it when it was all set up? To which I say, because that's also a thing when somebody specifically undoes, unstages a scene like that, that they've created, it's like a psychological thing where they're showing remorse and they're feeling pretty shitty about what they've done. And suddenly it's like, oh my God. And the reality of what's happened is sinking in. And it's also possible that it's like, yes, this was done. It's staged. It's going to look great. And then just seeing her somehow really hit home for him. And it suddenly he realized what had happened and he panicked and was like, oh my God. And just starts like trying to undo things and then realizes what a mistake I've made. But I also think you, if you touch the body multiple times in front of a police officer, that's a pretty good reason why your fibers from your clothes and all of that are on the body, right? So to me being like, would I, why would I stage it if I was just gonna, and it's like, well, it's a, it's a thing that some people do. They stage it specifically so that they can then unstage it. It's like, look, this is why my fingerprints were there. Right. So yeah, I don't have any proof so I'm not saying he's guilty. Don't sue me. I'm scared. Yes, we're not but, saying um, that. I mean, it could also be the guy that uh, killed himself the day after the DA was like, we're coming for you. And he panicked and shot himself. I have sure. found zero connection to him and their family or him ever knowing she even exists. But that doesn't mean it's not there. Even though it seems like maybe that wasn't actually a suicide and that it was staged and that maybe the, that happened to try and exonerate the Ramseys further so that maybe John Ramsey could try and get his money and his life back together. But again, we're just speculating. Um, yeah, you know, cons I'm just going to say a few things. Burke had a history. We know for a fact he hit her. He hit her with a golf club in the head and she died from a blunt force trauma or, or that was part of what was found when she died. Yeah, a, a severe one. We know that Burke's fingerprints were on the bowl of pineapple and milk, weird uh -huh. snack. Yeah. Um, and we know that she had pineapple in her system when she died. I know that people have speculated, and I do think that there is something in the possibility that he was having that snack 
she toddled in, she stole some or took some or something. He reacted in a typical kid way, but overkill, picked up something, maybe it was a flashlight or something, who knows, hit her too hard. Holy shit. Now, again, that would say, what about blood splatter? Where's all that? But we also know, as you've stated, that Patsy and her friends were cleaning the kitchen. So were they using bleach? Because who knows? Now, granted, like, again, luminol, et cetera, I don't know if it would still show up or not. Point being, however, it does feel possible to me that it could have been something accidental like that that has gone wrong. Other things that that back that up again are these new pieces of the of the 911 tape. For example, a male voice we're assuming John saying we're not talking to you right now sounds like it's probably directed at Burke. And Burke yeah. saying a child's voice we're assuming Burke is Burke saying what did you find feels mm. I don't know mm-hmm pretty damning and to your point i'm sure they didn't want to lose both children and i'm sure in that moment what who knows where your mind even goes i don't even know you know what i mean like if you're nine-year-old let's just say i'm i'm speculating i'm not accusing but let's just say for a second yeah you're the you're the ramses and you you discover that your nine-year-old has just accidentally killed your six-year-old who the fuck knows what you do right Maybe you would write a three-page ransom note. Maybe you, like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it would be, again, I think it's easy to say, no, I would call the police and tell them my nine-year-old just committed murder. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, manslaughter. Um, I think that's a lot easier said than done. I think that it is, it feels like, again, and also the fact, very sadly, that it appears that there was, prolonged abuse going on in the home we don't know who that was from or what but it feels again like unfortunately all signs are pointing that this did originate and ended in the home very sadly um again there's so many things that i think we could get into again we could talk about this literally for forever we could talk about this for 12 hours but again i i think also if you want to get into like the statistics of when children are taken what are the percentages of intruders killing them in the house and leaving them in the house. I don't have those numbers. My I thought is, is that it's pretty low. I don't think that it's yeah that high. Um, again, the fact that, that nobody heard anything feels odd uh, mm-hmm. at any point. If it, again, I, if we're speculating about it being an intruder, it just feels like there's many, many, you know, a lot would have had to line up for that to happen. Why wasn't mom and dad tied up? You know what I mean? Like why, if there was an intruder, why was only one person in the household targeted? And if it was her, why wasn't she taken out of the household? And you know what I mean? Like, again, like, because you do hear about kids getting snatched from their houses, but I, I personally have just never heard of them being then found within the house, you know? And what are the odds that like they were out for the evening at a friend's house And then the next morning they were flying out somewhere and then they were going to be gone for days and then they were going to come home and then they were going to be gone again for weeks. So it's like, what are the odds? They just happened to get there and get to her before they were about to not even be home. Right. Again. Yes. And what is this intruders again? Like, yeah, it, it it just starts to feel again, like again, a lot of things had to line up exactly Mm-hmm. correctly unless then it is a friend of the family in some way but then again it's like trying to there's just been no connection there's been no physical evidence and there's also word that their private plane that was going to leave that it was going to leave at like 6 15 and she was only getting up at 5 30 and she was still in the middle of packing and she had to get two children up and dressed and ready to go. And then they had to get to the airport. It's like, they weren't going to make that flight time. No. I mean, you don't have to go through, if you're flying private, you don't have to go through security or anything like that. You can just literally walk onto the plane. So you can show up right at the time, but unless it was like in their backyard, that feels like they're cutting it pretty damn close. 
Right. So I then it that- feels like maybe she just said she got up. I, again, again, it's, we're speculating, it's, we're <laughs> speculating, but it's, and again, you know, we start I'll, I'll reiterate what we started this episode saying, which is there's a reason why this case still is on the minds of, of so many. And that is because mm-hmm. it truly is infuriating, befuddling all of the above. And it really is just such a tragedy. It's so horrific that she was just, you know, she really has not gotten any justice and, and her, her short life was just had so much chaos and horror um, certainly at the end. And we have no idea throughout, we have no idea what goes on behind closed doors. We have no idea what that life was like. And, and it is, you know, the hope only is that there is some sort of justice and hopefully, you know, who knows, who knows it, it it's never too late. That's what I stick with. That's why we still, that's why I think, again, why people have a fascination with true crime, or that's part of it for me, again, is the hope that, that eventually that it will work out and we will get justice and we will put the person behind bars and we'll see. We just need that one thing. Just need one thing. That one thing that they can piece together that leads to the end, really. That's what they need the closure. Yeah. Christy Oxborough, thank you so much. You really weathered the storm through <laughs> what was both of us have been truly, um, yeah. truly very anxious about. You did great. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Lots yeah. of info in there. Again, there's so yeah. much to wade through and I think you did a really good job at, con- <laughs> at getting it down to a cool two hours and uh, 40 minutes. <laughs> well done. Um, thank yeah, you so yeah. much everyone for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this again. We know this was very requested. Um, uh, listen, we've got some exciting news because next week's episode is going to be something hot off the presses. Uh, there's going to be a, uh, at the, the time that this has come out, I don't know. My timeline is all off. My brain is so fuzzy. It will have already been released. The documentary it, will all the, have been already docu- have been released. The documentary releases in two days from now. Great. Okay. So, so the time, by the time they hear this. Great. Yes. So we know a lot, a lot of you, you like to watch ahead of time. There is going to be a Netflix documentary dropping February 10th called Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. This is, of course, about Elisa Lamb. It is a wild, wild, unsolved mystery murder. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about on the next episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. So make sure you you prep, you pregame, you watch the doc, you get ready for that. Chrissy's going to find out all about that. Uh, and the other thing we're going to do right now is we're going to uh, stop this Zoom and then we're going to start another Zoom. And it was my birthday last week. And Christy sent me a beautiful care package full of gifts. And I am going to open them. And we're going to record that for one of our last call episodes for Patreon, which is kind of criminally insane, but we're just going to roll with it because we think it could be charming and fun. Uh, so again, if, you, uh, if you're one of our patrons, thank you so very much. We're so excited to see you there. And if you aren't yet, make sure you check us out, patreon.com slash Cocktails. We've got lots of fun bonus episodes. We've also got uh, bonus episodes with guests coming up, including young Ben Feldman from the hit show Superstore and the fabulous, amazing friend of mine, Stephanie Beatrice from Brooklyn Nine Nine. So if you're interested in that, check that out. Follow us on all the social medias. <sighs> I'm running out of steam. I think I've hit mostly everything. Christy, did you did you want to say goodnight to the people? Thanks for making it this far. <laughs> This is, this is, today's been a beast and this was, uh, this was a lot. So thank you. And, uh, we love you and good night. Yeah. If you're still listening now, you are the true of the true crew.